we present The Smiler with the Knife by Nicholas Blake, dramatized by Barry Campbell, starring Jackie Smith Wood as Georgia Strangeways and Simon Cadell as Nigel Strangeways. The Smiler with the Knife. Mm. I say, listen to this. The Duchesse de Palma is very showy, orange-red, edged with yellow, a splendid bedder. <laughs> she sounds just your type. Hmm. Shall we have the Duchesse in the garden, Nigel? Nigel? Hmm? Oh, sorry, darling. You haven't heard a word I've said. Uh, no, sorry. It's this extraordinary letter. Oh, uh, not another case. What is it this time, murder or blackmail? Oh, neither, neither. It's our hedge. Hmm? Listen. Pursuant to the provisions of an act of parliament, pom 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 pom, I, the surveyor of highways, do this day, the fifteenth of March, nineteen thirty-eight, pom 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 pom, hereby give you notice and require you forthwith to cut, prune, and trim your hedges adjoining the county roads. Goodness, what happens if we disobey the S of H? Um, yeah, we get complained off to a justice of the peace. Mm. Hmm. Well, in that case, I think I'll have a go at the beastly hedge this morning. More coffee? Tell me, would you mind very much if I left you? No, I think I've already had two cups. For another man, you mean? I should be very cross indeed. <laughs> Don't be silly. Went off on my travels again, I mean. Any particular expedition in mind? Mm, not exactly, but... I suppose I'd get to be all right. It would seem a long time, though, till you came back. Oh, Nigel, I'm so glad I married you. So am I, darling. Are you? Really? Really. Otherwise, I'd have to cut the edge myself. You beast! Oh! Ah, uh, Georgia, mm. you're hacking your way through the jungle. Oh, goodness, it's hard work. I must look like Medusa. Mm. Mm. Here, look what I found. Buried treasure. Is it gold, do you think? Well, some sort of locket. A very cheap one, not gold, alas. I wonder how it got here. Folk courting under the hedge. Chuck it away. Oh, let's look inside first. <laughs> I couldn't get it open. No, I put a pen knife. Oh, yeah, that's, that's got it. What's inside? Photograph of some pop-eyed peasant, I bet. What do you suppose EB stands for, see? Yeah? A small Union Jack with E.B. stamped on it. Eat British? Is that all? <laughs> no, it's a picture of a woman with long hair. Hmm. I say, she's a beauty. Hmm. What's she doing in a trashy locket with a Union Jack? That's just what I was wondering. It's odd. I think I'll keep it. What a snooper you are. I find an old locket and you sent a mystery. Come on, let's go and get some lunch. I'm famished. Georgia, we have a visitor. I heard. You go. I'm busy. I'm... I'm all right. Evening. Uh, Keston's the name. Major Keston. A farmhouse over the hill. Took the liberty of calling. See how you'd settled in. Well, please come in, Major. Ah, thank you. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> this way. Hmm? Ah, snug little billet, this. <laughs> How does the uh, mem like country life? Mem? Oh, Georgia. Oh, yeah, very much. Uh, she'll be down shortly. Uh, drink. Uh, thank you. No, I never touch it. Uh, ought to have called before. Uh, tell the truth, I was a bit scared. <laughs> Your mem being a famous explorer and so on, wouldn't expect her to have much time for simple village folk like us. <laughs> I don't think you'll find her very terrifying. Hi, George. Who's... Oh. Uh, uh, Georgia, this is Major Keston. Ah, how do you do? Major Keston, of course. I'm so glad you looked in, Major. We've heard so much about you in the village. <laughs> really? Nothing bad, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> I say, I hope you don't mind my mentioning it, strange ways, but that's quite a lot of money to leave lying on your desk. There have been quite a few burglaries around here lately. Well, thanks for the tip, but I don't think it would pay any burglar to have a stab at us. My wife is a first-class revolver shot. <laughs> yes, I have shot one or two people. In self-defence, of course. Ah. Uh, and I suppose you're quite handy with a gun, too, eh? 
Have to be in your job, arresting murderers and so forth. Oh, no, no. I'm, I'm terrified of firearms. How very odd. Why, bless my cell. What's the matter, Major? There, on the desk. It's my locket. Wherever did you find it? I lost it last spring. Your locket? But... A bird. I beg your pardon? That's what it must have been, a damned magpie. Stole the locket, you mean? Exactly. A lot of the brutes over my way. A magpie. Must have been. Where on earth did you find it? It was in our hedge. There was only an old photograph in it. Yes. Uh, my mother, as a matter of fact. Really? We were very taken with her. I suppose she was quite young when it was done. Uh, yes, I believe so. Uh, must have been. Well, you better take it, Major. Do you mind if I have one more look at her? Oh, not at all. Thank you. Yes, she really was a beauty. Oh, oh dear, how yeah. clumsy of me. Oh, I'll just wipe off the dust with my handkerchief. There you are, Major. Good as new. Oh, thank you. Well, I mustn't keep you any longer. Oh, must you go? Afraid so, dear lady. Then let me see you out. Thank you. You really must call again when you have more time. Uh, I should like to very much. Goodbye. Bye. Just why did you give that sickening display of ingenuousness, dear lady? And why did you deliberately drop the Major's mother in the coal scuttle? I didn't want him to notice that you'd opened up the back and see the EB thing, so I rubbed coal dust round the rim. And anyway, it couldn't possibly be his mother. Well, why not? Because that hairstyle went out too long ago. A fancy dress, perhaps? Hmm. A wig? No. No. But if it wasn't his mother, why was he so pleased to get the locket back? <laughs> Perhaps the Union Jack and the E.B. is the important thing. Hmm. I don't like Major Keston, and what's more, he's by no means the fool he'd like us to think him. Blackmail. You know, Georgia, I think I shall have to inquire a little further into these curious goings-on. Oh, Nigel, must you? <laughs> it won't affect you. Your job was over when you spotted the date of those ringlets. I wish I could believe that. Uh, I think we'll pop down to the Green Lion tomorrow evening. If we go early enough, we might find mine host alone. I hear you had a visit from the Major, Mr Strangeways. <laughs> you certainly travels fast in this village. <laughs> He's pretty popular in the district, I understand, Harry. Well, sure he is and he is and... He's well in with the farmers and with the gentry. <laughs> but, well, fact is, he's too bossy. Wants to rule the roost. Lots of folks don't like that. Mind you, his family used to be the squires here at Fullerton at one time. Oh. Ah, I didn't know that. I thought he was a newcomer. Well, he is and he is. Uh, the Kestons haven't lived here for two generations, and Fullerton House has been empty of late. So what I want to know is... Why didn't he take Fullerton House when he came home from India in 34? Perhaps he couldn't afford it. Ah, but he must have spent thousands rebuilding the farmhouse. And he brought in a lot of foreigners from London. I shouldn't have no shop with them. Good workers, though. Wonderful workshops they build up there. Workshops? We must walk over and have a look. Don't go at night, then. Why not? Because of the ghost. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you may laugh, sir, but none of us will go past the Arnold Cross at night. Isn't that right, Joe? What's that? The ghost. Oh, she's right enough. Mm. I seen her. Churning butter for me. There was a dairy maid at Yarn Old Farm. Her started making eyes at the farmer. So the farmer's wife took a stake and sharpened it yeah. and stuck it in the maid's oh. eyes. Maid rushes out of the house, fell down a well. Yeah, terrible. Has anyone seen the ghost recently? Young Henry, too. He was courting, went up the cross one night. That was after the Major came. Mind you, young Henry is a bit simple. I mind the time he went to the doctor's oh, one. Oh, dear, oh, we're in for it now. <laughs> Keston! India! I've got it! Oh, oh. The connection, I knew I'd heard the name before. There was some sort of scandal... Keston, that's right. He ordered his men to open fire on a crowd. Several women were killed. Good Lord. He was told privately that he'd better resign. Anyway. Shh, shh, shh. Someone's coming. Walking towards the Arnold Farm. Let's just step into these bushes and let them go by. This will do. Quietly now. From hospital by the Tramps. Going to the farm. 
I shouldn't have thought the Major would have much time for tramps. There's something fishy about them. For one thing, they seem to know exactly where they're going. For another, they're not slouching. Too upright, too... Military? Exactly. All right, say so they aren't bona fide tramps. What now? I haven't the foggiest. What do you say to another walk after dinner? Oh, Nigel, must we? Hmm. What a beautiful night. Hmm. So quiet. I wonder... Really, Nigel, this is quite absurd. What came ye out for to see? A retired major whom, on the strength of an old locket and a couple of dubious tramps, we suspect of what? I'm afraid you're not taking this seriously. Taking what seriously? If you ask me, the whole thing is... <coughs> what the... Come on, run, run, run! Oh, oh what, <coughs> what on earth was it? I... Last, what a fool I am. The crossroads is the perfect spot to place a sentry with a ghost story to back it up. Well, it shows they've got some fun and games going on. You showed great presence of mind, screaming like that. Uh, yes, yes, didn't I? <laughs> I took their mistake us for a courting couple and think they've scared us off. <laughs> well, what now? Well, I suggest we make a detour, go across country and hide in the wood overlooking the farm. That's a good idea. If there is something on going on, we might catch a glimpse of it. Mm. It's as near as we can get without being seen. What are they up to? Can you see anything? Hmm. It, it's a gang of men unloading that lorry. Tramps. They're all tramps. Very well disciplined tramps from the way they're going about their business. Those boxes, I've seen. Something similar before. Well, it seems you were right after all. There is something fishy going on. Very fishy indeed. So what do we do now? Nothing. We go back the way we came, and tomorrow we arrange to go up to London and consult Uncle John. <whistles> Scotland Yard? You think it's that important? Yes, Georgia. Yes, I do. And now, perhaps you two clams will open up. Nigel has hardly said a word since he rang you last night, Uncle John. Secrets, secrets. <coughs> well, are you going to tell me or not? No, wait. I'll just see that there isn't a masked man outside the door with his ear clamped to the keyhole. Good day, Mum. What? There, there is a man there. One of my men, as a matter of fact. It's that important. Well, anyway, I know what all this is about. Long, narrow cases, you said, Nigel, and heavy. Very heavy. Smuggling. I think they're smuggling. Smuggling what? Oh, what do people smuggle? Brandy? Dope? Why not machine guns? Machine guns will do. You're not serious. No? Do you remember the Cagular in France, Nigel? The hooded men, yes. It was a conspiracy to overthrow the popular front government and set up a fascist dictatorship. Arms dumps were discovered in Paris and other cities. Mm, it nearly came off, too. None of your comic opera plots. But you're not suggesting... Not in England. Have either of you ever heard of the English banner? E.B. English banner? I see E.B., the E.B., printed on the flag in the locket. Exactly. Well, now, this English banner is a queer sort of society that flourishes mainly in the country districts. They believe in the natural aristocracy of the landowning classes. They're, well, they're, they're quite harmless. But if they're harmless, why... You would just consider. If you wanted a good cover for a dangerous organisation, what better than a harmless one? Which brings us to your military friend. Keston is a man with a grudge and considerable organising ability. As you know, he was politely sacked from the Indian police. He's just the kind of material the big people in this movement can use. But have you any evidence for connecting them? Oh, yes. The really interesting thing is that disc you found in the locket. You see, we've got one or two people inside English Banner, and I asked them about it after Nigel telephoned me last night. They report that there is no such membership token. And that means the discs are only in use amongst the inner circle of the movement. It all sounds absolutely melodramatic to me. Conspiracies are melodramatic, Georgia. Well, I'm worried to death about this. I don't mind saying so. Well, I can't believe it. What proof have you got that Major Keston is smuggling arms? Nigel. The tramps gave me the clue. 
Why tramps and why on foot? Why not just roll up to the farm in cars? No. It seemed to me that the only reason why people should disguise themselves and plod all the way to Yarnold Farm is that they were local bigwigs who couldn't afford to be recognised. Then the shape and size of those boxes left me in no doubt. But why couldn't the Major just invite them to dinner, all open and above board? Or if they didn't want to be recognised, why not just bring in a gang of weightlifters from somewhere else? It's not easy to import strangers into a remote spot without rousing talk. Major Keston mm. had done it once, remember, when he was improving the farm, and I'll bet oh. one of those improvements was a cosy underground ammunition chamber. You see, Yarnold Farm was chosen for its strategic position. A cargo of arms could easily be landed at sea, he said, Cattle Cove, and then transferred to the Majors and unloaded under the cover of darkness. Then why not get together a posse and burst into the Major's cellars? Uh, no, no. Don't want to put them on their guard yet. Just stop them landing any more arms for the present. And how do you hope to do that? I've already done it. Tipped off Jimmy Blair. He'll write up the Arnold Cross Ghost for the daily papers and that'll bring hordes of sightseers and psychic researchers to the farm. <laughs> the Major will have to suspend operations till it blows over. Very clever. Our main problem is to try and find out who the real leader of the movement is. And to do that, we, uh... Well, we want you to take a hand, my dear. Me? Uh, but I did... Why not Nigel? You're the only one of us, apart from Nigel, who has seen the picture in that locket. And that picture is our sole clue. You have the entree to fashionable society, and it is there we have to look for the centre of the movement. Also, I'll be frank with you, you are a bit of a legend in the country. Therefore, this movement will be glad to make use of you. And equally, you will be excellent propaganda against it when the time comes for a showdown. <clears throat> Conspiracy foiled by famous woman explorer, that sort of thing? The reason why Nigel has to keep out of this is obvious. He's my nephew, and his connection with the police is well known. <laughs> They'd never trust Nigel. But surely that applies to me. I am married to Nigel. Uh, <clears throat> yes. My dear, the idea is that you should not be married to Nigel. What? Simply arrange a separation. Not a legal one, of course. Just drop a hint to the gossip writers. They'll do the rest. Uh, have I got this right, Uncle John? You have the almighty nerve to suggest that I should separate from Nigel, create a scandal and go off on some wild goose chase after some individual who probably doesn't even exist. You're asking too much. Uh, Nigel, why don't you say something? You've cooked this up between you. You're asking me to... I'm asking you to do it for England. I should take it on if I were you. It wouldn't be for long. Regard it as another expedition. Oh! Why did this have to happen just as I was settling down to a nice, comfortable old age? It's worth doing, you know. You're just the person to do it. Oh! Oh! When do I start? Good girl. <laughs> um, I suppose the first thing to do is to stage manage our separation. We shall have to work out every move, every sordid letter and business item, as though it were the real thing. That's the part I don't like. However, if it has to be done, then, then I suggest you have the cottage and I'll move into the London flat. <laughs> I suppose we must hold the newspapers. Mm. Essential, I'm afraid. Mm. Famous explorer, Pan's domesticity, that sort of thing. <laughs> I'll put you in touch with Alison Grove of the Daily Post. She's a good sort. <laughs> Meanwhile, you'll have to be coached carefully. Thoroughness and patience. They're the things that really matter in this sort of work. Read all about it. Woman explorer in divorce scandal. Read all about it. Alison, as punctual as ever and looking marvellous. Uh, thank you, my dear. Are you ready to go? I don't want to be late. Where are we off to tonight? Oh, a sort of country town, Trey Snob. Tell me, do you really enjoy all these parties you go to? But of course. You see, I'm an indoor girl at heart. And besides, think of all the pickings for my column. I'm the butterfly that's stamped. Stamped on what? On all the other butterflies, of course. Now, do come along, <laughs> in here. It's like a cauldron. It's unhealthy. Hush, my dear. A dark lady is coming into your life. I'm so glad you could come, Miss Grove. <laughs> Madame Alvar is our hostess, my friend Mrs. Strangeways. Ah, delighted. How do you do? Allow me to present my husband, Don Alvarez. 
So we'll find some very interesting people here tonight, ladies. I hope you like our little place, Mrs. Strangeway. Indeed. But it is rather hot. Oh, my husband feels the cold so horribly. He is not used to our climate yet. Well, enjoy yourselves. <laughs> Who on earth is that preposterous marionette? The husband of the owner. Well, that's the story at any rate. What do you think of Madame? Sevil and Surbiton. <laughs> she looks somewhat discontented in spite of the grand manner. So would you if you were married to the oldest tortoise in the zoo. <laughs> uh, however, we all have our consolations. Perhaps Peter Braithwaite will be here tonight. He's a cricketer, you know, the England batsman. Cricket? Oh, yes. Well, it takes all sorts. You'll like him. Come on, let's go and eat. You know, there's something odd about this place. It, it doesn't ring true. Mm. I know what you mean. Still, nothing amiss with the food. Mm. Mm. Ah, there's Peter. Peter, darling. Oh, uh, Alison, mm. uh, see you later. Rather tied up at present. Oh. Mm. <laughs> Rather dashing. Mm, yes, isn't he? He's certainly alive, which is more than I can say for most of the others. Oh, Madame Alvarez seems to think so, too. <laughs> what on earth can he see in her? He's positively goggling. Who knows? Perhaps he's just being kind to her. Perhaps. Well, what now? Bridge, I think. After that, well, as soon as we decently can, we'll slip away. I've got to get under Henley for the weekend, so I don't think I can. No. Thank God to be in the fresh air again. Alison. I said, oh, Alison. Sorry we didn't get a chance to talk, Peter. Uh, this is Mrs. Strangeways. You were obviously far too busy. Uh, yes. No luck yet, Alison. And what did you expect? You're far too young. <laughs> it's good for you, Mrs. Strangeways. Well, you've had a look at the bowling. What do you think? Bowling? What on earth? Uh, quite a good actor, uh, Peter. Positively gobbling, I think you said. But do you mean you're not in love with that creature? <laughs> then why? Well, you'd better ask Sir John Strangeways about that. Uncle John? It's all right, Georgia. No need to worry. You see, Peter and I are both working for him, too. Well, I'm... <laughs> You dissembling little cat. <laughs> and you think that this club is... It's being used by people behind the EB movement, yes. Ah. And I think it's time we took the offensive. I've managed to find out there's a secret room where they have meetings of some kind. Oh. It's supposed to be a gambling den, but I'm not so sure. Anyway, something's due to happen next Thursday, and I suggest that we gate crash. Might be as well if we had another chap on hand, just in case things turn nasty. Yeah. Mm, good idea. I know, I'll rope in cousin Rudolph. Rudolph Cavendish. The MP. Mm, that's the one. He'd be an excellent witness if things do get out of hand. Cavendish! I say, Cavendish! Oh, stand by, I think the fun's about to begin. You are Cavendish, aren't you? Yes, I'm in. Yeah, wonderful memory for faces. Well, I'm going to tell you something, Cavendish. More to this club than meets the eye. I say, steady on. Oh, yes, there is. Yeah. Things go on here as you scarcely believe. Uh, news to me. Georgia, I'm all right, right Mrs. Strangeways. <laughs> Just telling Cavendish here. Don't mind people having a little flutter. <laughs> live and let live, I say. But I, I, resent, I bitterly resent this hole in the corner business. I mean, if I want to gamble, my money's as good as anyone else's. Of course it is, old man. Now, come and sit down. There's a good You may be an MP, Cavendish, but you're a rotten bad listener. Now, Madame Alvarez told me they play roulette here. Point is, why is any Tom, Dick or Harry allowed to play but not me? Hmm? Well, I'm damn well going to play. And what's more, I'm going to do it now. Now, look here, you're upsetting the ladies. Leave I... me alone. All right. I'll hit you for six. For heaven's sake, Peter, everyone's staring at us. Let them. Leave him to me. I think I can manage him. Come along, Peter, I want to see the fun. Good for you. A lot of stuffed shirts. Follow me, I'm in the way. I'm so sorry. Poor chap. A bit pickled. What the... Oh, I'm Isabella. terribly sorry, <laughs> madame. Mr Braithwaite is a little above himself. Peter, come away. I'm sure madame Alvarez is busy. Oh. Never too busy to see me, eh, ducky? <laughs> I want to play roulette. Peter, please, you mustn't. I want to play roulette! There is no game tonight. Mrs Strangeways, can't you uh, do something? Uh, look. Press this little button on the wall and no. open sesame. Oh. Oh. There! What did I tell you? Roulette. Bloody roulette. He's drunk. How beastly. What is the meaning of this intrusion? 
Naughty, naughty. A gambling den. Well, I promise not to tell the police if you let me play. This is a private party, senor. These are all friends of mine. Now, sir, will you leave or must we use force? I do apologise, senor. Please forgive Mr Braithwaite. He had a little too much to drink downstairs, I'm afraid. Please, do not apologise, madame. Uh. It is I who should do so for my seeming inhospitality. But you realise that my guest... Come along, Peter. I'm sure Signor Alvarez will allow you to play some other time. But I want to play tonight. Peter, come along. Oh, all right. I wonder what Sir John Strangeways would think of this, Mrs Strangeways. Professor Steele, isn't it? <laughs> Officially, he'd disapprove, no doubt. I do hope that we do not have a police spy in our midst. What the devil oh, do you mean? Oh, I won't tell on you. As a matter of fact, I shan't be seeing much of Sir John now. Oh, then you really have left your husband. It's not just a publicity stunt. I hardly think that the ubiquitous Professor Steele is quite the right person to make charges of publicity, Sinton. <laughs> Madam, as one victim of the press to another, I offer you my humble apologies. <laughs> Come along, Peter. It's time we went. Well, there it is. Talk about a wild goose chase. All that trouble for nothing. Not for nothing, Peter. Come on. Out with it, Georgia. What happened up there? Well, for one thing, did you notice, Peter, that when we went in, all the heads were turned towards the door? Well, they'd been warned. Madame rang the bell under her desk, announcing that some rough fellows were going to burst in on their roulette. But don't you see? If it had been just a roulette game, the only point of the bell would have been to warn them to hide any evidence of an illicit game. But they didn't. They didn't hide anything. They wanted us to believe they'd been playing all the time. But they made the mistake of looking up when the door opened. You mean real gamblers would have been far too absorbed mm. in the game to pay any attention to a door open? Exactly, and the ball was still rolling. So you see, Peter, that game must have been bogus. By Jove, Georgie, you're right. You're absolutely right. Quite all right. I like dogs. <laughs> Why, it's Mrs. Strangeways, isn't it? I'm Celia Mayfield? Yes, of course. How clever of Oswald to find you here. <laughs> Do you live in London? No, uh, just up for a few days. Uh, my father has a place in Berkshire. He trains racehorses. Oh, that must be fun. Horses to ride and the downs wide open before you. Oh, it's all right, I suppose. I get bored, though. It's all very well for you. I mean, you can go exploring. You're as free as air. <laughs> I want to do things, but... Daddy, oh, well, you know what fathers are like. Mm. He'd like me to ride side saddle and sit at home in the evenings with a good book. He uh, wouldn't approve of roulette, I take it. Glory, no. He'd go up in smoke. I say, you, you won't let on. Oh, don't worry. Do you play much? It's the excitement. Excitement? Watching a little ball twiddling round? Maybe there's more adventure in it than you think. Well, if it's adventure and excitement you're looking for, perhaps you ought to try Nazi Germany. Things seem to be happening there, all right. Yes, it's, it's wonderful. I've never been there, but I can imagine it all. The spirit of youth and confidence and so on. Sometimes I wish we had something like that in England. Not fascism, of course, but something like it. Adapted to our national character. Get rid of all those old doddering politicians. Mm, yes, I quite agree. We've given democracy a fair trial and it's let us all down. Let the best people rule. I say, you're not a member of English Banner, are you? English Banner? What's that? Oh, it's just something I belong to. You'd rather like it. Tell you what, why don't you come and stay with us in Berkshire? Then you could come to a local meeting of the Banner. It's just your sort of thing. All right, I will. Good for you. Now, when will be the best time for you to pay us a visit? Hello? Georgia, thank God you're home. Look, can you come round to my lodgings right away? Why? What's happened? It's Madame Alvarez. She's turned up here. She's in an awful state. I, I, I just don't know what to do. See, I, I've got to go out and... I'll come now. Oh, bless you. It's Feltham Court, St John's Wood. Mm -hmm. I'll take a taxi. Be there as soon as I can. Oh, thank God you're here. I've calmed her down a bit. When she got here, she was almost hysterical. Problem is, I'm due at Lord's at ten. 
Can you can you hold the fort for a bit? Mm. I couldn't get hold of Alison. I... Off you go. Leave Madame A to me. Oh, Georgia, you're a brick. So long. Bye. Are you feeling any better, madame? Would you like me to get you a doctor? Oh, no, no doctors. I'm not going back. Never. Don't let them take me back. Please, don't excite yourself. You're quite safe here. Oh, you don't know them. My husband, he was so angry. He will hurt me. He locked me in my room, but I escaped. He was angry because I let Peter into the roulette room. He frightens me. Surely he'd never hurt you just because you were a little indiscreet about the roulette room. Are you sure he's not jealous about... Well, about you and Peter. Oh, no, it's not that, I swear. Well, it must be something else. Some secret, perhaps? I don't understand. He just said no one must go into that room while they were playing, and I tried to stop Peter. I did. No. Oh, oh. I'm so sorry, ma'am. I told oh. them Mr. Braithwaite was out, but they just... Why, whatever? No. My dear, you gave me such a fright oh. going off like that. <laughs> Luckily, I found Mr. Braithwaite's address in your book. <laughs> Now, you must come home at once and go to bed. Uh, we'll send for your doctor. Uh, Charles, James, help, madame. No, no, no. Is everything all right, ma'am? Yes, thank you. The, the lady has been taken ill, that's all. If you say so, ma'am. I won't be far away if you need me. Mm. Senor Alvarez, if you leave your wife with me, I assure you she will be in good hands. I am sure of it, madame. But I could not think of putting you to so much trouble. Oh. Uh, you will understand when I tell you that my wife suffers from recurrent delusions, a form of persecution mania. Uh, at such times, she has to be confined. Expert medical attention is needed. Mm. Now... If it will set your mind at rest, please accompany her home with us and speak to her doctor. Believe me, I realize just how distressing this must be for you. I wonder if you do. Very well, I agree. She must go home at once. But I will come with you and I will speak to her doctor. You look awful. What's happened? Oh, Georgia, it's such a dirty game. It's Madame Alvarez. She's dead. Dead? It was only a week ago she came to me. And I couldn't raise a finger to help her. But how did it happen? I was afraid they'd do it. I should have done something to stop them. You can't mean they killed her. But I saw her safely home and spoke to her doctor. Uncle John assured me that his credentials were impeccable. All the same, he's one of them, I'm sure of it. What did she die of? Oh, some obscure disease. No, it was all above board, proper death certificate and so on. They even called in a specialist. Oh, they move with the times these chaps are up against. Nothing so old-fashioned as blunt instruments. Just a neat little dose of microbes. Peter, tell me, who was this specialist? Can't you guess? Professor Hargreaves Steele. The tropical disease man? But he's one of the... Mm. My God! Exactly. I tell you, Georgia, you've got to watch your step where the English banner are concerned. Do please be careful in Berkshire. Don't worry, Peter. I mean to be. Good morning, Celia. Have you brought the good news from Ghent to Aix? <laughs> I, I've had a lovely ride. Did you see me up on the hill? Good boy. Tommy, look after Banner, will you? All right, old mess. Come on. Don't the planes upset your horses? Oh, they've got used to them. We've got three aerodromes within a radius of 20 miles or so. We've all got used to them, I suppose. Used to the air being the element of death. I say, you're not a pacifist, are you? No. I just dislike the idea of being killed without having a chance to hit back. I wanted to join the Civil Air Guard. But Daddy wouldn't let me. He thinks flying isn't womanly. Hmm. You should tell him to read Metalink's Life of the Bee. Daddy, read a book. That's a laugh. Tell me, what did you think of the meeting last night? Uh, do you want me to be polite or honest? I hate people being polite. Very well, then. I thought it was a ridiculous piece of hocus-pocus. Oh. Not the idea itself. I wouldn't have joined if I thought that. But really, all that talk, peevish and feeble. Why did not they do something instead of whining all the time? Haven't they any guts? Your brothers look as if they have, but they just jabbered away with the rest. We're not quite so feeble as you think. 
We're helping to get things done. Really? Writing to the Times or what? What would you say if I told you that in less than a year's time we'll have swept away the Democrats in Britain and set up a real leadership and a real leader? I'd say you were dreaming. Not at all. A real leader. Do you know his name? I shouldn't be allowed to tell you even if I knew. Very few people in the movement know his name. Then how do you know he's any good? He's planned the whole thing. That's how we can tell. The organisation is simply amazing. Oh, yes? The whole country is divided into six districts, each with its own organiser. Mm. Then each district is divided into sections and subsections. The inner council. Oh. Oh, but uh, perhaps I'm saying too much. No, it, it's very interesting. Would you come in? Our inner council thinks you'd be invaluable. You bet I'd come in if I thought you had any chance of success. But tell me, did they ask you to approach me or was it your own idea? After all, I'd have thought they'd be rather suspicious of me. I did marry into the police, so to speak. I wouldn't have approached you unless I'd been told to. The movement doesn't encourage its members to be indiscreet. Believe me, you've been thoroughly investigated already. Have I really? Daddy, I... What the devil do you mean by... Oh, I <laughs> beg your pardon, Mrs Strangeways. Uh, didn't see you. Devilish hot today. Yes, isn't it? I'm sorry, Daddy. I didn't realise you were busy. We'll come back later. Yes, please. I didn't realise your father was an author. An author? Whatever makes you think that? I told you he only ever reads the form book. Oh, I thought he was busy going through a proof copy. Oh, that. I expect some publisher sent it to him for an opinion, some racing memoir or other. How interesting. By the way, I forgot to tell you. We've a rather special guest for dinner. Oh? Chili's coming. Chili? <laughs> Lord Chilton Cantelow. Daddy trains his horses. The sporting millionaire. I'm impressed. You will be when you meet him. He's a grand chap. I shall look forward to it. Well, this is nice, Mrs. Strangeways. I've heard so much about you. Indeed. And I about you, Lord Cantelow. We have something in common, I believe. Oh? What can that be, I wonder? We both like taking risks. Taking risks? I thought you'd retired from active service. Are you planning another expedition? <laughs> well, no. It's so exciting in England at the moment, isn't it? Exciting? Yes. I feel we're on the edge of great events. The stay-at-homes will see the fun this time. <laughs> My goodness. You sound as if you were going to start a revolution or something. <laughs> yes. Yes, I think you'd make a splendid Joan of Arc. <laughs> well, if I do start a revolution, you'll have to finance it. <laughs> but, seriously, with all this international tension, something's bound to break soon. Uh, tell me, what's the feeling in Germany now? I haven't been there recently. Oh, they're scared, like us. Only they shout a good deal louder to hide it. I say, Chili, we're all going over to Hartgrove tomorrow to see the big air show. There are going to be some bombers on show. And Wildy's giving a display of aerobatics. Oh, young Gerald. Well, what do you say, Mrs. Strangeways? Why not? It should be fun. Now, oh, that's better. Now, where is that proof? Oh, here it is. Fifty years on the turf. To be published September the 5th. Hmm. It's a long time before publication. Let me see. Nothing here, not a mark, not a clue. Damn, September the 5th. Try page 5. Nothing. Page 9. Hmm. Nothing here either. September, 9th month. 9 5 is 45. Eureka! Marked letters. I knew there was something fishy going on. Now, W I will D will D dangerous dangerous a uh, uh, range accident. Will D. My God, young Wildman, the young stump pilot. I must warn him. Oh, but, but if I do, they'll know I've been spying on them. But if I don't. What shall I do? Hang on, though. This has all been just a bit too convenient, a bit too neat. A chap who seldom reads anything but the form book, correcting proofs, and those same proofs, complete with secret message, left about for anybody to find. 
all the same. Suppose Wildman's life is in danger. I wonder. Well, my dear, nobody said it was going to be easy. Georgia, my dear, we thought we'd lost you. Come and meet one of the stars of the show. Gerald Wildman, Mrs. Strangeways. How do you do? Yours is a pretty dangerous job. Oh, I don't know. One gets used to it. I feel a lot safer in a plane than I would trekking up the Amazon. <laughs> uh, but if you'll excuse me, I must go and earn my keep. Mr. Wildman? Yes? Uh, good luck. Thanks. Now, come along, everybody. We'll watch this from the main stand. I'm looking forward to this. So am I. I do hope nothing happens to him. Why should anything happen to him? Well, stunt flying is dangerous. Don't worry. Wildy knows what he's doing. He really is very good. Isn't he? It must be wonderful to fly like that. He's still climbing. It's his best stunt. Watch this. He's diving. He's cutting it a bit fine, isn't he? He'll never do it. Oh, God! Now watch! Well, that's all right, then. Yes. I'm very glad. So am I, my dear. So am I. Two white ladies, madam. Mm. Thank you. Oh, Alison, it is nice to see an ally again. Same here. How are Nigel and Uncle John? Well, Nigel's still at your cottage, and Sir John is very worried about this EB business. He won't be when he sees my report. So you haven't been wasting your time in Berkshire. Are you going back there? No. Chili's asked me to stay at his place. Chili? Lord Cantalope. Well, you haven't wasted any time on nickname terms with a noble lord already. Not only that, my dear, I'm pretty sure that he's our man. What? Oh, no, that's too much. Why, oh, he's got everything. Money, power, popularity. Oh, he'd never risk all that, especially now. Now? Haven't you seen tonight's papers? Millionaire plans millennium, a new nationwide plan for the abolition of unemployment in Britain. Good Lord! Oh, it's a scheme on a heroic scale. It's brilliant. He's putting up a million of his own money to get it started. Why, he's the most popular man in Britain at this moment. And, therefore, the perfect man to seize power when the EB take over. Hmm. It's odd his coming out into the open like this, just as I've begun to get proof that he's the man behind the English banner. Don't flatter yourself, my dear. You're just a nice little woman to him. <laughs> or perhaps a nasty little nuisance, depending on how much he suspects me. Do you know that when Wildman was doing his stunt, Chilly's eyes were on me the whole time? Oh, Alison, it was awful. I had to gamble with his life for fear of being discovered, and all the time Cantalo was watching me, just waiting for me to warn him and give myself away. It was all a plant, you oh, see. Oh, my goodness. But there's something else, and this is why I'm sure that Lord Cantalo is our man. Would you like another drink? Oh, Georgia, tell me. Well, after the air display, there was a party, games, charades, all that sort of thing. You know how the English love dressing up. Ooh. Well, I pretended to go to bed early. I hoped they might be off their guard if they thought I was out of the way. Later, I sneaked downstairs again. They'd all had quite a bit to drink by that time, so nobody paid any attention to oh, what has this got? Shh, I'm telling you. After about an hour, I decided to go to my room. On the way back, I happened to glance into the dressing room where they were getting ready for another game. Yeah. Well, in the mirror, I caught a glimpse of Chili, and I almost fainted on the spot. He was wearing a black wig, parted in the middle, and with long ringlets uh, falling to his shoulders. <laughs> that would have had me swooning with laughter. Yes, except that the face I saw in the mirror was the face of the woman in Major Keston's locket. Georgia, welcome to Chilton Ashwell. Do you want some tea? No, thanks. I've already had some. I think your house is perfect. But why are you all in white? Have you been Morris dancing? Morris dancing? Oh, <laughs> what a tortuous mind you have. We've been playing cricket. Oh. It's all one to Mrs. Strangeways. She doesn't know the difference. Hello, Georgia. How was London? Hot and frantic as usual. 
But tell me, Peter, what are you doing here? Have they thrown you out of your county side? <laughs> no, we've no fixture today. So Lord Canslow asked me to play for his team against one of the local sides. Oh. They're holy terrors. Yes, we don't dope the wicked here. Shows you chaps up when you've got to play on an honest piece of turf. <laughs> uh, now, if you'll excuse me, there are one or two matters of a domestic nature which I must attend to. Perhaps you would care to instruct Georgia on the laws of cricket while I'm gone, Peter. <laughs> no, I don't think so. But I will challenge her to a round of clock golf. Excellent. I can't play clock golf. That's all right. I'll teach you. Oh, damn, I've missed again. I'll <laughs> never get the hang of it. Did you really come here just to play cricket? Not entirely. Alison, let me know you've begun to play the big fish. Were you surprised? Blast! <laughs> missed again! After all the things we've come across recently, I shouldn't be surprised to learn that Lord Cantalow was ready the Dalai Lama. No, you're not doing it properly. It's, it's all these horrid bumps on the grass. I thought clock golf was played on a level surface. It is. His lordship laid this out himself. Probably wanted to make it more difficult. He's a great games player, our host. And what's more, he seems to have taken a fancy to you. Either that or he's become suspicious. Oh, do be careful. I can't help thinking of poor Madame Alvarez. Peter, are you any good at riddles? Riddles? When is a clock not a clock? Beats me. When it's a map. Now, I'm going to throw my club on the ground in disgust, just in case we're being watched. I'll bet we are. <coughs> now, you keep playing. Go round again slowly while I sit here on the grass and watch. I want to study the layout carefully. Yeah, well, what's all this about, Georgia? Well, I've an idea that this course represents a map of England. If I'm right, the position of the holes and starting numbers will tell us something. Good Lord, you're not suggesting Cantalow would lay out a map right under everyone's nose. Sounds crazy, doesn't it? But then he is a touch crazy, isn't he? Well, Georgia, how did the golf go? It was awful. I gave up in disgust. <laughs> you should have tried Morris dancing. <laughs> Why are you looking at me like that? How am I looking at you? As if I was a new kind of equation your teacher had chalked up on the blackboard. Perhaps you are. I can't quite place you. Do you always have to place people? When they might be dangerous to me, yes. <laughs> How could I possibly be dangerous to you? If you don't know, nobody does. <laughs> this is a very odd conversation, considering we've only met once before. Uh, we're neither of us ordinary people. Do you suppose we should talk about the weather? It's a safe topic, especially when you're dealing with a dangerous person. <laughs> I don't play for safety, neither do you, by all accounts. No, there's not much risk for a traveller these days. Travelling? Oh, yes. But uh, where are we talking about travel? Georgia, have you any idea what an electrifying creature you are? Why, with a woman like you, one Oh, Chilly, there you are. I've been looking for you everywhere. I need your advice. Damn. My dear professor, how can I help you? Well, and what news on the EB front this morning? Peter, I was right. The golf course is a map of England. I've been comparing it with an atlas in my room. And what's more, the even numbers fall in county districts. Taking the location of Major Keston's house as one, I reckon the other five are also arms dumps. Good Lord. Celia Mayfield said they had divided the country into six districts. The centre hole is obviously Nottingham. Isn't there a huge arms factory there? Nottingham, that's odd. The trouble is, it's all too vague. I must get more information before I pass it on to Uncle John and get it quickly. I've got a nasty feeling that things are hotting up. A riot here, an attempted assassination there, sudden unexplained panics on the stock exchange. All very carefully organised. It's all very disturbing. But how to get more proof, that's the problem. Mm. There's only one way that I can see. I'll have to burgle Cantalet's study. Oh, for God's sake, be careful, Georgia. How will you know where to look? You may have a foolproof safe. I already know where to look. Did you notice last night when we had pre-dinner drinks in the study, he kept touching that globe of the world thing? Oh, the terrestrial globe. Yeah, that's it. He seemed fascinated by it. Well, I'm sure that's the key. Like the golf course, out in the open, hide a tree in a forest, that sort of thing. Why odd? I'm sorry. I... When I mentioned Nottingham, you said that's odd. Oh, good Lord, I almost forgot. It's just that this morning before breakfast, I happened to overhear a telephone conversation. Mm. A chap named Goats is passing through tomorrow, and somebody's left an address for him. I remember it clearly. I thought it might be a bookmaker. Sam Silver. <laughs> 420 Eastwaite Street, Nottingham. It could be the EB's Nottingham headquarters. I'll pass it on to Uncle John at Scotland Yard. Then again, it could all be perfectly innocent. All the same, I've thought of a way to make sure. 
If I take off today, I could present myself at Mr. Sam Silver's house as Goat. But suppose he's known there. No, otherwise why leave him the address? Yes, you're right. But it's damned risky. Oh, don't worry, I can take care of myself. Anyway, ours is a risky business. There's no more risky than breaking into his nib's study. Right, don't be surprised if I disappear. I shall be very surprised, at least where Cantalo is concerned. Do you have any idea where Peter's pushed off to? I only wish I knew. Hmm. You don't think he's got into some sort of trouble or had a brainstorm or something of a sort? <laughs> oh, no, that's not possible. He seemed perfectly normal when I last saw him. Still, it's not like him to go off and leave his team in the lurch. Georgia, his team happens to be England. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps he's been kidnapped. That's an idea. Kidnap Peter Braithwaite and sting the MCC for a whacking ransom. <laughs> oh, I can't see anyone getting much joy from the MCC. But, uh, <laughs> I ought not to joke about his sudden disappearance. I'm forgetting what a great friend of yours he is. Oh, I don't know him all that well. Although I have sometimes thought that there's rather more to him than just the cricket idol. I wonder... Oh, come now, my dear. If anyone gives the impression of leading a double life, it's you. What? Do you mean, sir? Well, <laughs> you're a woman in love with adventure, everyone knows that, and you have the ability and the means to gratify it. Instead of which, we find you trotting round dull country house parties. It's suspicious. Nothing odd about a provincial, middle-aged woman slowing down. Oh, don't belittle yourself, my dear. It's not in character. Oh, by the way, I have a favour to ask of you. Mm -hmm. I've some people coming down tomorrow, the chief backers of the Chiltern Fund. Would you mind playing hostess for me? I should be honoured. Thank you. Uh, but remember, you must treat them nicely and keep a watch on that witty, outspoken tongue of yours. Oh, I wish I knew how far I could trust you. Trust me? You sound very serious of a sudden. Have you ever heard of the English banner? No. Uh, what is it? It's a society that believes in the principle of aristocracy and the rule and government of the superior persons. <laughs> superior persons, indeed. Oh, my dear old thing, you're playing at medievalism. Surely you're not taken up with that sort of nonsense. Oh, I know the EB can sound a bit cranky and absurd, but do you think that the principle behind it is sound, that some men were born to rule the rest? I used to be all for democracy, but now, well, just look at the mess England is in. Georgia. Have you turned fascist like Herr Hitler and his gang? I don't like their methods, but you must agree that they get things done. Mm, and the trains run on time. Now, what's all this leading up to, little Georgia? It could be leading up to a leader. A man who could be a great leader if he had the right organisation behind him. Well, supposing there was such an organisation, wouldn't it have chosen or wouldn't it choose its own leader? Mm, I don't know about that. All I do know is that the best man should and would get to the top. Oh, well, good luck to him. No, I'm far too lazy for that sort of thing. I can't keep up with you and your voices, Madame Joan of Arc Strangeways. <laughs> you won't make me your dauphin of the storm, unless... Unless? Excuse me, my lord. Uh, yes, what is it, Rivers? The telephone for Mrs Strangeways, my lord. It's the Daily Post, madam. Oh, dear. What can they want? And how on earth do they know I'm here? Excuse me while I get rid of them. But of course. Hello? Hello, Georgia, it's Alison. Sorry to ring you there, but it's very bad news, I'm afraid. It's Peter, we thought you ought to know. C can you speak up, please? Can you be overheard? That's correct. Sorry to break it like this, but there's been an explosion in Nottingham, some sort of arms dump. Peter's dead. Georgia, are you there? Yes. Sir John Strangeways had announced that an IRA explosive store had blown up. You seem very sure of your information. There's no doubt, I'm afraid. Sir John's been in Nottingham with a team of experts. He has definite evidence of Peter's involvement. Poor Peter. He was due to pay in the tap. I'm sorry. Yes, I heard you quite clearly, thank you. But there's absolutely no truth in the rumour that I'm planning another expedition. I have quite enough to do here in England. Take care, Georgia.
Yes, thank you. Goodbye. How very interesting, Mr. Strangeways. I had no idea you were so well informed about tropical diseases. Travelling in the tropics, one can't help but take an interest, Professor Steele. You really must come and visit my laboratory. I should love to. But if you will excuse me, gentlemen, I'll leave you to your brandy and cigars. Oh, thank you, my dear. We do have some rather boring business to discuss, as it happens. We'll join you later. Not too much later, I hope. Oh, believe me, we could never be so ungallant. And now for that damn globe. Hmm. It seems to be all of a piece, all the same. Perhaps it's on the join. Hmm, that's no good. It's too well made. Oh, catch on the frame? No, blast. Perhaps if I press. But where? England? The same as the golf course. Now. Eureka! I knew it! She put in her thumb <gasps> and pulled out a plum and said, What a bad girl am I? Wouldn't you like a little more light? You'll strain your eyes trying to read that. Oh, don't try yelling for help or this gun might go off and I shall have to explain that I thought you were a burglar and shot you by mistake. I shall have lots of witnesses. You little bitch. So it is you. I was sure that you must be our leader, but I had to prove it to myself. Come off it, Georgia. I know you're a spy. Oh, you lulled my suspicions for a while, I'll admit. It was clever of you not to warn Wilden at the air display, but... Hmm, I was never quite sure of you. That's why I kept you near me. Well, and what are you going to do with me? Hand me over to the police? Oh, dear, no. No, I'm afraid you've got yourself into hotter water than that. You'll have to be disposed of. What good will that do? Isn't it obvious? It's not obvious at all. Sir John Strangeways at Scotland Yard knows all about it. That silly picture in the locket was a mistake, and so was the clock golf course. Oh, yes, we know all about your arms, Dumps. Oh, what an infernal nuisance women are. The golf course. So that's how that meddling fool Braithwaite got onto us at Nottingham. He was responsible for the explosion there, you know. Several of our people died with him. Good for Peter. Pity. It was a fair bat on his day. Well, it's all no great trouble. I shall have to move the dumps, of course, but these things can always be managed. Yes, I know. Money talks. But there's one thing you lousy egotists with money forget. That this country is full of decent people who don't take bribes. <laughs> there are, however, quite enough who do take bribes. You'd be surprised, my dear. So what? Even supposing you start your revolution at all, a few innocents will be killed and then you'll collapse. Oh, you'll get away, no doubt. The rats always do manage to leave the sinking ship. You know, Georgia, you're really quite clever for a woman, but not clever enough. There is a world of difference between mere cleverness and genius. So, you think the English banner revolution is going to fail? I'm sure it is. You're quite right. I intend it to fail. That plan you're still hugging to your bosom, uh, you may read it before you die. We'll call that plan A, but there's another, a plan B. The trouble with you, Georgie, is that you lack subtlety. You've got a second-rate mind like that keyhole-peeping husband of yours. It's wonderful how unimpressive you are in the role of genius through the ages. <laughs> ah! You swine! You bloody swine! Oh, rest assured, the E.B. Rising will take place all right. Cabinet ministers will be assassinated. There'll be panic on the stock exchange. The civil service will be thrown into confusion. Broadcasting house will be occupied. The daily papers closed down. And while flights of bombers threaten Westminster, the government will be forced to hand over power to the English banner. And then... I shall intervene. I should perhaps add that my partners, my future partners in Germany, are awaiting the outcome of events with great interest. And should matters prove more difficult to manage than I expect... They're prepared to lend a hand. I see. So all you and your precious English banner amount to is a sort of fifth column. First to give your jack-booted friends an opportunity to attack England, and then to stab us in the back. You are contemptible. <laughs> Come along, little Georgia. It's time to go. 
I'm putting you in one of the upstairs rooms for a little while. Now, if you'll walk in front of me slowly and carefully. That's the way. In here, please. Ah. Oh. Light is working. So you'll be able to read. I'm afraid there are no sheets on the bed. It's just as well, perhaps. Dangerous girl like you might well make a rope of them and climb out of the window, like they do in schoolgirl books when there's a fire. <laughs> well, so long, my dear. You've had your little adventure, haven't you? As to your demise, I must consult Professor Steele. I don't know if he has any maggots with him. I'm sure he'll think of something. Shall we say, um, oh, half an hour? Keep you time to read those plans. <laughs> you know, you're not such an efficient spy after all. Are you, my dear? Let me out! Let me out! Oh, that's no good. Oh, Nigel, if only we were doing this together. Keep cool, my dear. Now, what would Nigel do? Keep calm. Evaluate the situation. Right, first, the door. Hmm. Too solid. Chilton Ashwell was built to last. The lock. <clears throat> Strong. There's nothing to force it with anyway. Oh, Georgia, what to do? Cantalo was right, I'm afraid. I have had my adventure. <laughs> heroine in a schoolgirl book, indeed. Some heroine. Whenever there's a fire... Chilly, I can't force the door, so I'll burn it down. Now, let's see. Nail file, handkerchief, a cigarette, lighter. Thank God I'm a smoker. Now, notebook, what to burn? Notebook, yes. Plans, no. Ah, cupboard drawers are usually lined with paper. Eureka! Now, what else? Mattress block. Mm. Mm. Lovely. Now, mm. let's see what we can do. <coughs> let's pray it doesn't get out of hand. Fire extinguisher, just in case. Wait and see, my dear. I knew it. I thought I could smell smoke there. It's coming from under that door. Damn, they come too soon. Stand back, Professor, while I open the door. Careful now. <coughs> Where the devil is she? There's smoke, I can't. She's here! What the devil is. Ah! Ah! My eyes! My eyes! Hello? Alison, it's me, Georgia. Oh, thank you. Guilty, I'm afraid. I'd have indulged in murder, too, if I'd had the sense. I only managed robbery. I stole his Rolls Royce in order to get away. <laughs> but listen, I've got Cantalo's plans. Two plans, really. Places, dates, everything. Oh, well done. The thing is, I can't seem to get in touch with Uncle John at Scotland Yard. Not surprising. He was knocked down by a car this morning. The EB worked quickly, it seems. My God. He's not... No, but in a critical condition, by all accounts. But tell me, where are you? Uh, Manchester. I drove to Chilton Station, booked to London, and later I changed trains. I've got a room in a quiet hotel, The Grange. Stay there. I'll arrange for someone to pick you up and escort you to London. All right. But if I do have to leave here for any reason, I'll try to get to Oxford and Nigel. Take care, Georgia, and don't trust anyone. Mm. Cantalo's got to get you now, otherwise it's all up with the English banner. I know. It's a rather chilling thought. Oh, Alison, you will let Nigel know I'm all right. Yes, of course. Remember now, stay where you are and we'll come and get you. 
Could I have my key, please? Room 43. Certainly, madam. Did your friends find you? I beg your pardon? Two young men were asking for you. They said they'd call back. Uh, there must be some mistake. They described you exactly. Um, excuse me, I've just remembered something important. But madam, your key. Oh, Georgia, you're on the run. What to do? I can't go back to the hotel. Damn! Alison's chap will have a wasted journey. I say, Mrs. Strange, wait. Just a moment. My God. They haven't wasted any time. I say, we'd like a word with you. What shall I do? A, de a department store, just the thing. They'll never kidnap me in the middle of a crowd of shoppers. Let's hope they're all men chasing me. They'll need to be made of stern stuff to follow me into the ladies. Excuse me, madam. The manager would like a word, with you? The manager? I don't understand. He would like you to explain the presence of certain articles in your pockets. I'm afraid I don't understand. Please let go of my Better elbow. Better wash the dirty linen in private, madam. This way, please. Now then, Mrs... Uh... Smith. Mrs. Percy Smith. I demand... Would you know... mind emptying your pockets, please? I... Oh, very well. You know, this really is very naughty of you, Mrs. Percy Smith. Oh. Please don't distress yourself. <laughs> Hallam and Appleby never prosecute first offenders. Oh, but... That'll be all. Thank you, Smithers. Yes, Mr. Dickens. And now, Mrs. Strangeways, what can I do for you? No need to look so surprised. I heard you lecture at the Travellers Club a couple of years ago. I used to do a bit of exploring myself. I went on one of the university expeditions to the Antarctic. I don't understand. I know enough about you, Mrs. Strangeways, to be quite sure that if you really wanted to steal things from this store, you'd have no difficulty getting away with it. So, I asked myself, why does the astute Mrs. Strangeways allow herself to be caught red-handed? That answer came there none. How long have you been a member of English Banner, Mr... Dickon. Uh, Mr. Dickon. Never heard of it. English what? That window looks out on the front of this store, doesn't it? Just go over and glance down. Well? See those groups of men hanging about by the entrances? Yes, I do. They're waiting to get hold of me. I'm working for the special branch, counter-espionage. It's vital that I get away from here today. This is something big, Mr. Dickon, so big that I don't tell you more. Indeed, I may have been mistaken in telling you so much. What about the police? Well, I had rather hoped that you'd escort me to the nearest police station for shoplifting. I've been wandering about for hours trying to think of a way out. But now I'd much rather that the police were not brought into it. I see. Tell me, where roughly do you want to get to? London? Uh, further west, shall we say? Excuse me. Oh, hello? Uh, the furnishing oh. department? Tell me, what vans do we have going out today? Darling, Mr. Dickon, I'll really have to take you with me on an expedition someday. What a comfort you'd be. Of course it was a penalty. But it wasn't given because the referee wasn't looking. Wasn't looking? Wasn't looking. He was bloody blind, that's why. Language, Joe. Uh, you all right, miss? Hmm? Oh, sorry. I was dozing. Yes, yes, I'm all right. Do I look all right? Well, <laughs> to tell you the truth, that cap and moustache makes you look a bit like Charlie Chaplin. <laughs> <laughs> the boiler suit does the help. Oh. How far have we come? Uh, about 45 miles. It'll be getting dark soon. I can't help feeling that we're not going to get away as easily as this. Are you prepared for anything? Well, it will take a lot to stop this van. Now, I'm not saying... What did you me. say about trouble, miss? There's two cars across the road ahead. Yeah. What should we do? Ram them. Good what? man. Yeah, well, what would have damage to the van? Well, Mr Dickon will take care of that. Right, stand by. Oh. I'm putting my foot down. Now, when we hit him, hold on tight. Ready? Here we go. Oh. 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 Hey. Oh. Steady, man. Duck the shooting! Bloody hell! Everyone all right? 
That was warm work. Mm. <laughs> They'll not try that again in a hurry. I sincerely hope not. Right, well, that's it, it wasn't. Oh, I'll give you, it was a hard tackle, but now I'm not so sure. Hard tackle, it was a bloody disgrace, huh? man. Oh. oh, what's happening? See what you've done with your language and shouting. Oh, I am sorry, miss. Where are we? Evesham. We'll be in Gloucester soon. Then it's only 50 miles to Oxford. Gloucester? Aye. I have been asleep. <laughs> what are those lights up there? Where? Oh. It's another roadblock, a big one up there, you see? Ah, the cunning beggars, halfway up the hill by the look of it. Just we'll have to slow down. Oh, we'll not get past that. Sorry, miss. Damn. All right, I'll, I'll drop off round the next corner. Whatever you say, miss. You uh, can... Joe, uh, stand by to open that door. Tell them you dropped me off at Evesham. Uh, OK. I'm slowing down now. Now, get ready. Goodbye. And thank you for your help. Good luck, miss. At least I shall be able to get rid of this ridiculous moustache. Uh, we'll come into the bend now. You ready, Joe? Aye. Now, jump! Do close the window, Robert. It's getting cold. In a moment, my dear. What are those flashes? Lightning, my dear. Very bright and with a pinkish tinge. I don't think it's lightning. No, it's something to do with that aeroplane that flew over just now. Flares, probably, looking for somewhere to land. Nonsense, Aggie. There's not an aerodrome for miles. Besides, the phenomenon of lightning without thunder is... Uh... God bless my soul. An aviatrix. And in my rose bed. Uh, are you all right, my dear? Did you, did you crash? Yes, thank you. Uh, no, my engine failed. A false landing. Uh, just a moment. We're, we're coming down. Here you are. Nice hot drink. Uh, Herbert, yes. I think you'd just better tidy the spare room. Yes, of course, my dear. Right and well. don't forget to put a hot bottle in the bed. Oh, yes, my dear. That's God bless myself. Now, what's all this about an aeroplane, my dear? Uh, a white lie, I'm afraid. There was a plane. It was dropping flares. I knew it. Looking for me, I think. You see, I'm on the run, engaged in undercover police work. Really? How interesting. Oh, I know it sounds fantastic, but it's true. I dropped off a lorry just outside Evesham and made my way across country. First an aeroplane and now a lorry. Perhaps it would be as well if I rang the police, just in case. No, please, it really is undercover work. You could ring Sir John Strangeways at Scotland Yard. Oh, no, I forgot he's still in hospital. Oh, dear, I... I'll go, Herbert. Oh, do you think you ought to? I, I mean... Now, don't worry, my dear. We're quite used to late callers at the vicarage. You just sit there and finish your drink. Good evening. Mrs Fortescue, isn't it? Yes. We're plainclothes police officers, madam. We're looking for a woman wanted on a car stealing charge. She was last seen in this vicinity. Uh, could we come in for a moment? There's no such woman here, I assure you. She may have broken into the house without your knowing. I don't think so. You've no objection to us searching the house, just in case? Oh, none at all. Oh, uh, you have a search warrant, of course. Oh, uh, well, as a matter you of fact... You haven't? Fact. Well, in that case, Look, no, I'm, I'm afraid... afraid I... you must insist. Insist all you like, but you're not entering this house without a search warrant. I'm sorry, but you see, we get so many beggars and undesirables at the vicarage that I can't possibly let you in until you've established your bona fides. And you see, not only have you no search warrant, but so far you haven't shown me any sort of identification. But on the other hand, my husband could ring the police station. Uh, that won't be necessary, madam. Good night. Good night. Good night, gentlemen. Have they gone? Yes, yes, you're quite safe. Policemen, indeed. They're too shifty by half. And anyway, their clothes were far too good. <laughs> And since when did the police drop flares to catch a car thief? No. Fantastic, though it seems. On the whole, I'm inclined to believe your story. Oh, thank you. And you will let me stay tonight? Yes, of course. More coffee? No, thank you, Mrs Fortescue. Herbert's gone over to the church so we can have a nice little chat. Oh, by the way, there's something in the paper this morning about Sir John Strangeways. Uncle John? Is he all right? Still critical, but they have hopes of an ultimate recovery. Thank goodness. Uncle John. 
You're Georgia Strangeways, the explorer, of course. <laughs> I thought I recognised you from somewhere. I'm rather glad I trusted you now. So am I. Thank you. Mind you, it was touch and go. Well, now, what is your next move? I, I don't really know. Only that I have to get away without being seen. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to reach Oxford. My husband's there. But someone is trying to stop me. There are quite a lot of them, I'm afraid. Tell me, do you know anything about eurythmics? Eurythmics? I used to do them at school. I should think my kind would be rather out of date now. Why do you ask? Because I think the Radiance girls are the answer to your problem. <laughs> the Radiance girls? Yes, Herbert thinks it's all rather pagan, but as I tell him, if the morals of this village can't stand up to a few strapping young ladies in magenta knickers... <laughs> magenta? Besides, we get them free. They're giving an exhibition at the village hall tonight, the Sisterhood of Radiance. Between ourselves, it's all rather soppy. But what has all this to do with me? Simply this. They come in a private bus, you see, so if you were to become a Radiance girl, you could leave with them. Mrs. Fortescue, you're a genius! <laughs> but would they let me join the troupe? You leave that to me, my dear. Nonsense! Mabel can't possibly be ill. She is, I'm afraid. Something she ate. You'll just have to perform without her. We do not perform. We interpret. We are vessels, we receive, and we pour out. But of course we can't possibly go on now, out of the question. Seven, you see. We must have seven, the seven-pointed star. Perhaps Miss Lestrange here could help you out. Really? Yes. Tell me, are you initiated? Are you one of us? In my own circle, I am known as the seventh pillar of light. Oh, how very interesting. Now, show me what you can do. La 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 la. Yes, I can see you have the tone, the vibrations. Hmm. Yes, all the same. I think you'd better stay at the back of the stage, dear. Now, I'll just dash and get your costume. Don't go away. Let's hope the stage is not too well lit. The hall's nearly full. Any strangers? Not that I can see. There's one odd thing. There's a Mr. Raynham standing at the back of the hall, watching everything very carefully. Is he a local? Yes, came here about five years ago. A gentleman farmer. If you ask me, he never was a gentleman, and he'll never be a farmer. <laughs> well, what happens now? Well, usually, Miss Agthorsby delivers some poems of her own. Goodness. They're quite awful, I'm afraid. And after that, well... The fun begins. <laughs> oh dear. Celeste dance till a frenetic frenzy of feminine freedom. The wild wind whistled through her glittering hair. Oh. Well, oh. oh. thank you, Miss Agrodi. Most in enlightening. Uh, and now, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me a great pleasure to introduce the, uh, the uh, Sisterhood of Radiance. One, two, three, and... Oi, oi, Jobbo, there's a tidy bit of goods in front. Just look at them bloomers. <laughs> Good night, and thank you so much for a, 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 a wonderful evening. Not one of our better exhibitions, I'm afraid. Those dreadful men. Now, girls, Goodbye. Girls. Good luck. Goodbye. I don't know how to thank you. Take care. Somebody broke into the vicarage this evening. Ring the police as soon as I've gone. Mm. I think I will. Have you got something I can stick in? Someone waving us down on the head, Mum. Might be an accident. Yes, Mum. Oh, what a night! Sorry to hold you up and all that. 
and the driving of friends to Cheltenham. The car broke down. Yes, sir. He's in rather a hurry. Train to catch. Do you mind if we come along with you? He's blind, you see. Oh, but of course you will come with us. Poor oh, man. Thank you so much. Most kind. This way, sir. There now. You sit here next to this young lady. She'll look after you. I'll sit over here. All right, driver. Hurry up, sir. Evening, Georgia. Fancy meeting you here. You've led me quite a dance, my dear. Are you ready to come quietly, as they say? And if I don't? My friend, Mr. Raynham, has a revolver. He will compel the driver to take a side road and everyone on the bus will be shot. I can't leave any loose ends now. You leave me no choice. Exactly. Raynham. Stop the bus. What the blue? They seem to have got our car going. It's coming along behind. We'd better change back into it. All oh, right, you are. Uh, this young lady is also going to Cheltenham. We may as well give her a lift. Oh, I'm not sure that I can allow it. It's quite all right, Miss Hackthorsby. This gentleman is an old friend of mine. Oh, well, if you say so. Good night. Thank you all so much. Thanks, oh, well, please, don't worry about your friend. She'll be quite safe with me. They say I may recover my sight eventually. <laughs> I'm afraid you won't recover yours, my dear. I shall make quite sure of that. Oh, wouldn't you like to scream or something? No one will hear you. No? Well, I hope you'll enjoy our little game of blind man's buff. I'm coming to get you now. Georgia. Hey, what's going on? Urgent message for the chief. Well, he's busy downstairs. Here's my authority. Open up, blast you. It's urgent. Very urgent. Everything okay? All okay, thanks. Chief told me to take this dame away. What's left of her? And dig a nice big hole. She did us a lot of harm. Where's the chief? Busy with the message I gave him. So long, and thanks. Put her down over there, on the sofa. Oh. I... Oh, where am I? I... I must have fainted, Al. It's all right, Georgia, my dear. You're safe at last. Uncle John? Here, drink this. Oh, but, but they said you were in hospital. <laughs> I'm much tougher than I look, my dear. But I thought it best not to let the English banner know. But how did you find me? Is Nigel all right? Where is he? Oh, ah. Uh, ah, oh, no, no, no. One thing at a time. Nigel is well. 
He's waiting for you at Oxford. I've had the devil's own job keeping him out of it, especially when we heard that you were on the run. We found you by keeping a very careful watch on Lord Cantilow. We knew he'd have to come out into the open when Alison told us you'd got the plans. He followed you. We followed him. My chap saw him stop the bus last night. <laughs> what queer company you keep, Georgia. <laughs> well, my chaps followed you to that cottage, but we didn't dare attack in force in case he killed you. No. He wasn't going to kill me. Uh, Cantilow won't be allowed much more rope, my dear. How was he when you left? Unconscious, I'm afraid, sir. Well done. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Now, what about these plans? Oh, I shall uh, have to undress a bit, I'm afraid. I've been using them to pad out my rather meagre figure. <coughs> really? Actually, there are, there are two plans. One on paper and one in my head. Oh. Ooh. You've done well, my dear. Very well. Oh, Uncle John, he was going to put out my eyes. Was he? <laughs> was he indeed? The smiler with the knife under the cloak. Well, don't worry, my dear, it's all over. The cottage is surrounded. He won't get away, and by tonight the English banner will have ceased to exist. Cantilo will never harm anyone again. England is safe, my dear, thanks to you. We're all safe. All the decent, ordinary, hard-working people. The people who make up England. Oh, Uncle John. There, there, Georgia. It's all over now. Who was that on the phone, Nigel? Uncle John. Apparently mm. all the English banner leaders are to stand trial. Except... Yes? Except Chilton Cantelow. You don't mean he's to go... Free? free? No, no. Apparently he's been committed to an asylum. Spends all his time playing with a mechanical race game and a rocking horse. Poor chap. Oh, God. What's in the post, darling? Just the usual. Circulars and bills and... Good heavens. I don't believe it. What is it? Just listen to this. Hmm? Inasmuch as we have failed to cut our hedge, huh. we have to appear before a justice of the peace. We are to be prosecuted. Do you think they'll put us in prison? Oh, sure to. I'm tired <laughs> of London. We've broken the law. We must pay. Well, well, the thanks of a grateful country. Give it to me. I shall wear it next to my heart forever. <laughs> <laughs> That was The Smiler with the Knife by Nicholas Blake, dramatised by Barry Campbell. The part of Georgia Strangeways was played by Jackie Smith Wood and Nigel Strangeways by Simon Cadell. Sir John Strangeways, Jack May, Lord Cantelow, John Rye, Alison Grove, Susie Brown, Peter Braithwaite, Christopher Douglas, Madame Alvarez, Avril Clark, Senor Alvarez, Tim Reynolds, Celia Mayfield, Deborah Makepeace, Major Keston, David Sinclair, Professor Hargreaves Steele, Richard Durden, Mrs. Fortescue, Jill Balkan, Reverend Fortescue, Peter Howell, Miss Egg Thorsby, Pauline Letts. With Andrew Branch, John Church, Elaine Claxton, Stephen Harold, Sean Prendergast, Natasha Pine, Gordon Reed, Eric Stovell, and Jonathan Taffler. The Smiler with the Knife was directed by Jane Morgan. Whose Body by Dorothy L. Sayers, dramatised by Micheline Wander, with Gary Bond as Lord Peter Whimsey and John Cater as Bunter. Whose Body? Lord Peter Whimsey's residence. Good morning, Your Grace. Indeed he is. It's the Duchess, my lord. Uh, thank you, Bunter. Hello, Mother. How are you? Very well indeed, dear. Peter, dear, you know Mr. Thipps, the architect who's doing the church roof. Uh, yes, what about him? He's found a dead body in his bath. Well, sorry, Mother, I can't hear you. Found what? A dead body, dear, in his bath. Well, what sort of body? A dead man, dear, with nothing on but a pair of pince-nez. Oh. Was it anybody he knew? 
Oh, dear, I don't think so. He's terribly upset. I thought perhaps you'd like to run round and ask if there's anything we can do. Mother... Goodbye, dear. <laughs> oh, bother. Bunter, her grace tells me that a respectable Battersea architect has discovered a dead man in his bath. Indeed, my lord. That's very gratifying. Your choice of words is unerring, Bunter. My mother wants me to go round and talk to Sip straight away. Excuse me, my lord. The sale? Oh, damnation. Uh, look, you'll have to go for me. Make a special effort for the Folio Dante. I've marked the catalogue with my outside offer. I shall be back for dinner. such a state this morning, Lord Peter. I couldn't touch my toast. Well, I hate anything tiresome happening before breakfast, Mr. Phipps. When I saw that dreadful thing lying there in my bath naked, except for a pair of eyeglasses, I assure you, my lord, it turned my stomach. I had to have a stiff brandy. Wonderful what a little nip will do in a case of need. Not much of a view, what? Yeah, uh, just the backs of the other flats. What's that great edifice over there? Uh, that's um, St. Luke's Hospital Battersea. Hmm. See you're troubled here with the soot blowing in. Beastly nuisance. I have the same problem. Spoils all my books. Uh, Inspector Sugg thought one of the young medical gentlemen at the hospital might have brought the corpse around for a joke. <laughs> He went to ask Sir Julian Freak, you know, the surgeon, if there was a body missing from the dissecting room. And was there? I don't think so. Well, I suppose I'd better have a look at this one. Are you going to turn the sheet back, my lord? Of course. Ah, uh, oh. Uh. Hmm. Palmer Violet. Oh, dear. It makes me feel quite faint. Oh, uh, why don't you go make us both a cup of tea, eh? Ah, oh, good idea. Yes. Uh, uh, excuse me, my lord. A tall, stout man of about fifty. Thick, black, curly hair, cut and parted by an expert hand. Teeth stained with tobacco. A handsome pair of gold pons nez with a fine gold chain. Bit of a dandy, what? Now then, I'll just lift the head. Excellent, Bunter. The thought of the dante makes my mouth water. And you've saved me 60 pounds. Well, what should we spend it on? Would you like anything altered in the flat? There's an enlarger, I fancy, my lord, and a wide-angled lens would be useful. I happen to have a catalogue, if your lordship would... Hmm. Let's see. Fifty pounds seems a ridiculous price for a few bits of glass. I suppose, Bunter, you'd say seven hundred and fifty pounds was a bit out of the way for a dirty old book in a dead language, wouldn't you? It wouldn't be my place to do so, my lord. No, Bunter. I pay you £200 a year to keep your thoughts to yourself. <laughs> Tell me, Bunter, in these democratic days, don't you think that's a, a touch unfair? No, my lord. Bunter, if I sacked you here and now, would you tell me what you think of me? No, my lord. You'd have a perfect right to, my Bunter. And if I sacked you on top of the excellent coffee you make, I deserve everything you could say of me. Excuse me, my lord. You can buy your cross-eyed lens, Bunter. Ah, oh, Mr. Parker. Thank you, Bunter. His lordship's in the drawing room, sir. Thank you. Mr. Parker, my lord. Oh, my dear man. Beastly foggy night, ain't it? Uh, Bunter, some more of that admirable coffee, another glass of brandy and the cigars. Parker, I hope you're full of crime. Nothing less than arson or murder will do for me tonight. I've got a Dante and a body in a bath. What have you got? I've lost a body. Careless of you. 
I've been round to Queen Caroline Mansions in Battersea. Not Phipps' place. Yes, to see if the body in Mr. Phipps' bath was Sir Reuben Levy. Sir Reuben Levy, the financier? He's disappeared. So, when I got wind of this fellow in the bath, I buzzed round to have a look at him. And? The body in the bath would be extraordinarily like Sir Reuben if it had a beard. Old Sugg's quite taken with the idea that the body is Levy. Sugg's a hasty fool. He has taken Thipp's maid Gladys into custody. Oh, good heavens, what is he thinking of? Oh, oh hold on. Uh, Bunter, get yourself the proper things to drink and join the merry throng. Uh, certainly, my lord. Uh, Mr Parker has a new trick, the vanishing financier. Absolutely no deception. Hey, presto. Uh, tell Parker. Last night, Sir Reuben Levy dined with three friends at the Ritz. After dinner, the friends went to the theatre. He refused to go with them. At midnight, he returned to his house, 9A Park Lane. This morning, he wasn't there. His clothes were thrown rather untidily at the foot of the bed. No clean clothes were missing. He had washed and cleaned his teeth. And that's it? Mm, that's it. It's Duke Stodd, Whimsy. An important city man on the eve of a major financial transaction disappears in his birthday suit. Without his watch, checkbook and, and most mysterious of all, his spectacles. Well, even if he'd gone out to commit suicide, it'd have taken his spectacles. Well, Bunter, what do you make of it? It's odd that a gentleman who was too flurried or unwell to fold his clothes as usual should remember to clean his teeth. Indeed. But what did you make of the body, Parker? I should say he was a rich man, self-made, and that his good fortune had come to him fairly recently. Ah, you noticed the calluses on his hand. Both his feet were badly blistered. He'd been wearing tight shoes. And there were some little red marks all over his back and on one leg, which I couldn't quite account for. Quiet. Go on. His spectacles had a very beautiful patterned chain of flat links. I shall put an advertisement in the Times about them. See if anyone claims them. His nails were filed down to the quick as though he habitually bit them. Did you examine the bathroom? Yes. Did you notice that the soot on the window sill was marked? I did. Anything more? I'm afraid not. Well, I think you've got most of the points. There are just one or two little contradictions. For instance, here's a man who wears expensive gold rim pince nez, yet his teeth are not merely discoloured, but badly decayed. They look as if he'd never cleaned them in his life. Oh, these self-made men are terrified of dentists. Second point. Gentleman with hair smelling of palmer violet, manicured hands, never washes inside his ears. Full of wax. Mm. Nasty. Old bad habits die hard. Third point. A gentleman with manicure and the brilliantine and all the rest of it has fleas. By Jove, you're right. Flea bites. Fourth point. A gentleman who uses palmer violet for his hair, etc., washes his body in strong carbolic soap. Carbolic? To get rid of the fleas? Parker, you've got an answer for everything. Fifth point, carefully got up gentleman with manicured, though masticated, fingernails has filthy black toenails, which look as though they haven't been cut for years. Sixth and last point, his hair has been cut so recently that there is a line of dried soap on his cheek, and there are two longish black hairs in his mouth. Do you mean to tell me, Wimsey, that this man... Shaved his beard with his mouth open and then went and got killed with his mouth full of hair. He was shaved after he was dead. Uncommonly jolly little job for the barber, what? Somebody killed him and washed him and scented him and shaved him in order to disguise him and put him into Thipp's bath without leaving a trace. Excuse me, my lord. Why was Thipp selected for such an abominable practical joke? I mean, does he play the piano at midnight and annoy the neighbours? I mean, damn it all, Parker, we, we can't have a crime without a motive. A madman? No, I, I tell you what, Parker, we're up against a real artist and a blighter with imagination. Real, artistic, finished stuff. It's an elderly lady, my lord. I think she's deaf. Yeah. Hello? Yes, it is. It's old Mrs. Thipps. Really, Mrs. Thipps? No, but of course... At once, Mrs. Thipps. See you soon. <sighs> Suggs arrested Thipps. How about that? Oh, dear. Uh, Come along, Bumper. We'll collect the old lady and take her down to stay with Mother. Oh, and, and bring your camera. You can photograph the bath while we're there. Well, pa pack a bag, will you?
Has Mrs. Thipps gone to bed, Mother? Yes, dear. Such a striking old person. She tells me she's never been in a motor car before. But she thinks you a very nice lad. <laughs> Whatever made your Inspector Sugg think Mr. Thipps could have murdered anybody? My Inspector is determined to prove that the intrusive person in Thipps' bath is Sir Reuben Levy. His line of reasoning is, we've lost a middle-aged gentleman without any clothes on in Park Lane. We've found a middle-aged gentleman without any clothes on in Battersea. Therefore, they are one and the same person. So sad about poor Reuben. I used to know Lady Levy quite well, you know, down in Hampshire when she was a girl. Before he made his money, of course, in that oil business out in America. The family wanted her to marry Julian Freke. He's never married, you know. Lives all alone in that big house next to St Luke's Hospital. I dare say the old man has made one or two enemies. Dozens, dear. Such a dreadful place, the city, isn't it? Yes, I suppose it is, rather. I think I'll turn in now. Must be back in town at eight. Parker's coming to breakfast. I told Ellen to slip a hot water bottle in. Those linen sheets are so chilly. Ring if you want anything, dear. More toast, my lord. Uh, rather. Yes. Uh, more coffee, Parker? Mm, yes, please. I've been sleuthing on the roof of Battersea Flats this morning. What an energetic fellow you are. Mm -hmm. Did you find anything? Not much. I looked for footmarks, but with all this rain, there wasn't a sign. All the staircases open onto the roof. You can walk along it as easily as along Shaftesbury Avenue. Damned interesting. Uh, have you developed those plates, Bunder? Uh, yes, my lord. Caught anything? Well, I don't know whether to call it anything or not, my lord. You're the prince. Ah, thanks, Bunter. Now, see here, Parker. These are the fingerprints you noticed yesterday on the window sash and on the far edge of the bath. I give you full credit for the discovery. Mm. I crawl, I grovel, my name is Watson. <laughs> the criminal climbed over the roof in the wet and, not unnaturally, got soot on his fingers. He arranged the body in the bath and wiped away all traces of himself except two, which he obligingly left to show us how to do our job. We learn from a smudge on the floor that he wore India rubber boots and from this admirable set of fingerprints on the edge of the bath, that he had the usual number of fingers and wore rubber gloves. Mm. What do you think, Parker? I think we should go round to Park Lane and see what Sir Reuben Levy was up to in bed last night. Bunter, bring the camera. A water bottle, a silver-backed hairbrush, a pair of boots, a small roll of linoleum, and a book. Odd sort of fish, your employer. Isn't he? Very singular, Mr Graves. Now, if you just pour a little of this grey powder over the book while I hold it. Like this? That's very nicely done. Mm. See that? That's the finger marks. No, 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 don't touch them. You'll rub the bloom off. Now these are ready to have their portraits taken. Do you have to do much of this sort of thing? Any amount. Yes, Mr Graves, it's a hard life. Morning tea at eight, valeting by day and criminal investigation at all hours. It's wonderful the ideas these rich men with nothing to do get into their heads. I wonder you stand it. A quiet, orderly, domestic life, Mr Bunter, has much to be said for it. A footmark on the washstand linoleum. Yes, regular hours and considerate habits have a great deal to recommend them. Very simple in his tastes, Sir Reuben. Very simple indeed. Now the handle of the umbrella. Yet many of the time I've sat up till three and up again to call him early to go off Sherlock in at the other end of the country. <coughs> and the mud he gets on his clothes and his boots. In my opinion... Police work ain't no fit occupation for a gentleman, let alone a lordship. Boots chucked in a corner, clothes hung up on the floor, as they say. Oh, that's often the case with these men as were born with a silver spoon in their mouths. Now, Sir Reuben, he's never lost his good old-fashioned habits. Clothes always folded up neat. Five foot ten and not an inch more. Hmm. 
I suppose a six foot two man might leave a five foot ten impression in bed if he curled himself up. Come now, Parker, don't be frivolous. Come in. Ah, there you are, Bunter. What have you discovered? Uh, the book off the night table, my lord, has only the marks of one set of fingers with a scar on her right thumb. The hairbrush, too, my lord, has the same set of marks. The umbrella, the tooth glass and the boots all have two sets. The hand with the scarred thumb, which I take to be Sir Rubens, my lord, and a set of smudges superimposed upon them, which may or may not be the same hand in rubber gloves. The linoleum in front of the washstand is very gratifying indeed, my lord. Besides the marks of Sir Rubin's boots, there's a print of a man's naked foot. A much smaller one, my lord. Not much more than a ten-inch sock, I should say. What did I say, Parker? Five foot ten. Two sets of fingerprints on everything but the book and the brush. Two sets of feet on the linoleum. Well, think of it, Parker. To remember his fingers and to make that one careless step on the linoleum. Do you mean to I say... I mean to say that it was not Sir Reuben Levy who came home last night. Another man came here in Levy's clothes and let himself in with Levy's latchkey. He wore rubber gloves and did everything he could to make us think that Levy slept here last night. Mm. And Sir Reuben? Well, either Sir Reuben Levy has been spirited away for some silly practical joke, or this other man has the guilt of murder upon his soul. Oh, dear me, you're very dramatic. Do you know, Parker, I don't care frightfully about this case after all. I say, should we go home and have lunch? Well, you can, if you like. You forget I do this for my bread and butter. I haven't even that excuse. What are you going to do next? I'm going to get the family history of every tenant in Queen Caroline Mansions. I shall inveigle them into conversation and drop the words body and pince-nez and see if they wriggle. Well, just you toddle off and do it. I'm going to have a jolly lunch with Freddy Arbuthnot at the club. You will never become a professional till you learn to do a little work, Whimsy. Uh, come round for breakfast tomorrow, Parker, and we'll compare notes. I haven't seen you for ages. What have you been doing with yourself? Just fooling about, Freddy. Mm. <laughs> I think all clear, Mr Arbuthnot, sir. Which soup will you have, Whimsy? They're both equally poisonous. Well, uh, Claire's less trouble to lick out of the spoon. <laughs> <laughs> Claire, consomme polonaise, very nice, sir. Wine, sir? Oh, uh, the, uh, the Montrachet uh, eight. Very well, sir. Yeah, there's nothing fit to drink in this place. That's a rather deliberate insult to a noble vintage. How's the exchange? <sighs> Rotten. How about those Argentines? Argentines? Gone all to hell. Oh, Levy bunking off like that's knocked the bottom out of the market. You don't say so. What do you suppose happened to the old man? Cursed if I know. Perhaps he's gone off on his own. Giddy old blighter, some of these city men. Far from it. No, hang it all, Whimsy. He's a decent old domestic bird. His daughter is a most charming girl. I didn't know Levy had a charming daughter. Oh, yes. Met her and Mama last year abroad. That's how I got to know the old man. He's been very decent. Let me in on this Argentine business on the ground floor, don't you know? Well, you might do worse. I suppose that Yankee blighter Milligan will get the railway now, if old Levy doesn't bid against him. Is that Milligan a, a hulking brute with black hair and a beard? No. Milligan don't stand any higher than I do, unless you call him five feet ten, hulking. And he's bald. Oh, this can't be the fellow I had in mind. Poor old Levy. The old man's self-made, of course, but he don't pretend to be anything else. Toddles off to business on a 96 bus every morning. I suppose I'd better pop round and express sympathy or something. What? Please to meet you, Lord Whimsy. Won't you take a seat? Uh, my name's Peter. I'm oh. not a peer, you know. That's my brother Denver. Uh, look, it's, it's a damn cheap barging in on you like this, but the fact is, it, it's my mother, you know. Well, I'd be surely charmed to do anything for the Duchess. Well, that's uncommonly good of you. Hmm? Well, no, it's like this. My mother, a most energetic, self-sacrificing woman, don't you see, is, is thinking of getting up a charity bazaar down at Denver in aid of the church roof. Oh. It's a fine old antique, um, early English windows and decorated angel roof and all that. Vicar catching rheumatism at holy service, owing to the draught blowing in over the altar, you know, that sort of thing. Hmm. Well, none of us have any money. Well, not what you'd call money, I mean. My mother would be frightfully pleased, Mr Milligan, if you'd come down and, and stay a day or two and just give us a little 
breezy word on the oil business and the almighty dollar. Why, yes, I'd love to, Lord Peter. Uh, now, uh, perhaps you'd be kind enough to uh, accept a little donation to the restoration fund. Um, shall we say a uh, thousand pounds? Oh, that's awfully decent of you. I, I thought of asking Sir Reuben Levy, you know, and he's floated off in this inconvenient way. Yes, that's a uh, very curious thing. I, I don't mind saying, Lord Peter, that, uh, well, it's a convenience to me. We're uh, business rivals, you know, though I have nothing against him personally. Mm. Well, I mustn't take up any more of your time, Mr Milligan. <laughs> Ah, morning, old oh dear. Morning. Beast of a day, ain't it? It's very good of you to trundle out in it. Have some toast knocks for marmalade. And a newspaper. A coffee? Ah, uh, thank you. Thank you, Bunter. Hmm. Oh. Oil's in a bad way. Levy's made a difference there. That funny boom in Peruvians that came on just before he disappeared died away again. What was that? Oh, uh, an absolutely dud enterprise that hadn't been heard of for years. It suddenly took a new lease of life last week. Oh, interesting. Well, how did you get on yesterday? An intriguing piece of news. A young woman walking the streets of Battersea saw someone of Levy's description on Monday night. Splendid. Mm. Did you get anything at the house? Levy's private diary. Aha. Uh -huh. It's uh, full of little gems. Like uh, Tom and Annie to dinner. My dear wife's birthday gave her an old opal ring. <laughs> Mr. Arbuthnot dropped into tea. He wants to marry Rachel, but I should like someone steadier for my treasure. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's no entry for Monday. Let's have a look. Hmm. Uh, Bunter, br bring some more coffee, will you? Lord. Well, this terrible fighter at the stock exchange, who could with one nod set the surly bear dancing or bring the savage bull to eat out of his hand is revealed in private life as kindly, domestic, confiding, generous, and a little dull. A man came to mend conservatory roof. <laughs> um, in May, there's a mention of Lady Levy's nerves, and uh, in September, it says, um, Freak came to see my dear wife and advised complete rest and change of scene. Freak's name appears about once a month mm. as a dinner guest. Mm. On September the 18th, Lady Levy and her daughter leave for the south of France. Ah, October the 5th, Milligan to dinner. I've been to see Milligan. He looks all right, but you never can tell. He's got a jolly good motive for, at any rate, suspending Levy for a few days. Well, then there's the new man. What new man? Well, this letter arrived this morning. Very precisely written with a fine nib by an elderly businessman of old-fashioned habits. Crimplesham and Wicks, solicitors, Milford Hall, Salisbury, 17th November 1920. Sir, with reference to your advertisement today in the personal column of the Times, I am disposed to believe that the eyeglasses and chain in question may be those I lost on the electric railway while visiting London last Monday. I enclose an optician's specification which should suffice as an identification. Thomas Crimplesham. Promising, eh? Oh, definitely. More coffee, my lord. Ah, thank you, thank you. Now, Parker, look at these enlargements of Bunter's photos. The fingerprints can be divided into four groups. A. Levy's fingerprints on the bedside book and hairbrush. B. The smudges made by the gloved fingers of the man who slept in Levy's room on Monday night on the water bottle and the boots. 
On the left boot, we find the strangest thumb mark over the mud on the leather above the heel. Now, that's a funny place to find a thumb mark on a boot, if Levy took off his own boots. But it is the place you'd expect to see it if somebody forcibly removed his boots for him. Mm, very pretty. A bit intricate, though. Oh, well, it fits in with our previous ideas. Now, let's turn to see. Mm. The prints obligingly left by my villain on the edge of Thip's bath. The left hand, you notice the, the base of the palm and the fingers, not the tips, looking as though he steadied himself on the edge of the bath while leaning down to adjust something. Ponsnay, perhaps? It's gloved, you see, but showing no ridge or seam of any kind. Mm. Rubber? Hmm? Uh, D is from a visiting card of mine, the thumb marks of Mr Milligan. I think there's a decided resemblance between... B on the bottle and C on the bath. Mm, possibly, but the marks are so faint. But the fact that you and I happen to be friends doesn't mean that the two cases we're interested in have any necessary connection with one another. It would be different if there were any truth in the suggestion that the man in the bath was Levy, but we know for certain that it wasn't. It's ridiculous to suppose that the same man committed two crimes on the same night, one in Batters and the other in Park Lane. So, what's Thipp's bath got to do with Levy? I don't know. It is very odd that although the papers have carried a description, no one has yet come forward to identify the mysterious occupant of Mr Thipp's bath. Mm. It's as if the man has melted away out of society without leaving so much as a ripple. This, um, pince business. Perhaps someone planted them on the body to throw suspicion on Mr, um, Crimplesham. Yes, possibly. Crimplesham might have seen someone on the train. I think a journey to Salisbury is indicated. There's an excellent train at 10.50, my lord. Uh, kindly make arrangements to catch it. Oh, damn the inquest on Thipp's body is today. Well, I shall be there, Whimsy. What are friends for? <laughs> Pray, take a seat, Lord Peter. Oh. It's extremely good of you to come in person. I trust you are passing this way? Oh, I'm here on business. Happy to be of service to you. Very awkward to lose one's glasses, Mr Crimbleshaw. Oh, I, I assure you, I feel quite lost without them. And the chain has a great sentimental value. I was terribly distressed on arriving in Ballum to find that I'd lost them. Did you find them in the train? Well, no, I found them in rather an unexpected place. Do you mind telling me if you recognised any of your fellow travellers? Mm, not a soul. I thought perhaps the person with whom I found them might have taken them for a joke. I know practically nobody in London except Dr Philpot, the friend with whom I was staying at Ballam. I should be very greatly surprised if he is practising a joke upon me. Oh, forgive my inquisitiveness. Do you have an enemy? Anyone who might profit by your um, decease or disgrace? <laughs> Why do you ask such an extraordinary question? Mr. Crumplesham, you have no doubt read about the Battersea Park mystery. Your glasses are the pair that was found on the body, and they are now in the possession of the police at Scotland Yard. Good God! Are you connected with the police? No, not officially. I, I'm investigating the matter privately in the interest of one of the parties. My good man, this is a very impudent attempt. B but blackmail is an indictable offence. No, you misunderstand me, sir. I, I advise you to leave my office immediately. Silence, please. <laughs> yeah. Where are my throat lozenges? Oh. Oh. Yeah, open some windows, please. Oh, fucking hell, that's right. There's influenza about it. Ventilated rooms on the death ground. Oh, great Anyone who cares to object to open windows has the obvious remedy of leaving the court. And if there's any more disturbance, I will clear the court. <coughs> Call Mr. Thipps. Mr. Thipps? I see there. So great. Hey. Oh, hello, Mr. Parker. How nice to see you. Silence, please. We came up by car. I couldn't let old Mrs. Thipps come alone. The coroner's looking daggers at me. Do you think he'll clear me out of the court? <laughs> uh, Mr. Thipps. Can you tell the court when you discovered the body? When I went to take a bath at eight o'clock in the morning. Did you know the deceased? No. Uh, can you tell us your movements the day before? 
I was in Manchester. I arrived back at St Pancras at ten o'clock at night. Did you go straight home? No. Where did you go then? It's really very unpleasant for a man in my position. You must tell the court the truth. Take your time. Very well, sir. I... On the train back from Manchester, I, I met an old school friend. When we got to St Pancras, my friend suggested we ought to make a night of it. <laughs> I, I feared I was weak and let him persuade me to accompany him to a club, one of his haunts. I used the word advisedly, and I assure you, sir, that if I had known beforehand where we were going, I never would have set foot in the place. Um, how long were you in this uh, club, Mr. Phipps? Well, about half past twelve, things began to get a bit um, lively, and I was looking for my friend to say good night. He was um, with one of the young ladies, and they seem to be um, uh, getting on rather well, if you follow me. I thought I'd just slip away, and suddenly the lights went out and everybody was stampeding and shouting. It was a police raid. I was dreadfully afraid my photograph would be in the papers. I got a taxi and came home. What time did you get in? About half past one, I should think. Uh, did you go straight to bed? I took a sandwich and a glass of milk first. Uh, nobody sat up for you? Nobody. Uh, how long did you take getting to bed? About half an hour. Uh, did you visit the bathroom before turning in? No. And you heard nothing in the night? No, I just tumbled right off and didn't wait till Gladys called me. And then you noticed the bathroom window was open? Yes. <clears throat> oh, thank you. Uh, call Miss Gladys Horrocks. Yeah. Miss Gladys Horrocks. <clears throat> Uh, Miss Gladys Horrocks, Ed, Mrs. Thipps had a bath on Monday evening? Oh, uh, yes, she did. Monday was one of her regular bath nights. I'm afraid I left the bathroom window open on Monday night. I wish my head had been cut off before I'd been so forgetful. Uh, yes, my dear. Now, how do you think the body got into the bath? I don't know. Could someone have hidden it in the flat? Mrs. Phipps was in the drawing room. There wasn't no one in there. And I went into the dining room because I put Mr. Phipps's milk and sandwiches there ready for him. And there was nobody in there at all. Nor in my bedroom, nor in the hall. Uh, did you search the bedroom cupboard and box room? Well, no. Not to say searched. I'm not used to searching people's houses for skeletons every night. <laughs> uh, so a man might have concealed himself in the box room uh, or a wardrobe? I suppose he might. Have you a young man? <coughs> yes. I'm walking out with Bill Williams. He's a glazier. When did you last see uh, Mr Williams? The last time I saw him was on Monday. Oh. Monday night? Must I tell the truth? You must tell the truth, young lady. Oh, well, it's better to lose me place than to be hung. Though it is a cruel shame a girl can't have a bit of fun without a nasty corpse coming in through the window to get her into difficulties. After I put Mrs Phipps to bed, I slipped out to go to the plumbers and glaziers ball at the black-faced ram. Bill, uh, Mr Williams, met me and brought me back at about two o'clock. Why haven't you told anyone this? Well, I asked leave to go, and Mrs. Thipps said no, along with Mr. Thipps being away that night. I am bitterly sorry I behave like that. Uh, did you hear anything suspicious when you came in? No. I went straight to bed. Oh, thank you, Miss Horrocks. Uh, call Inspector Sugg. Inspector Sugg? I was called in about half past eight on Tuesday morning. I considered the girl's manner to be suspicious and arrested her. Later, suspecting that the deceased might have been murdered that night, I also arrested Mr Phipps. Uh, what was the evidence that led you to suppose that the death had occurred that night? Well, um... Uh, Are you saying that you have no direct evidence? Had the criminal left any fingerprints? There were some marks on the bath, but the criminal wore gloves. Do you draw any conclusions from this fact?
As to the experience of the criminal? Looks as if he was an old hand, sir. Is that consistent with the charge against Alfred Phipps, Inspector? I consider the whole setup highly suspicious. Phipps' <laughs> story isn't corroborated, and as for the girl Horrocks, how do we know this Williams ain't in it as well? Yes, yes. Oh, thank you, Inspector. Yes, uh, uh, Call Sir Julian Freak. Sir Julian Freak. Uh, Sir Julian Freak, you live at uh, St. Luke's House, Prince of Wales Road, Battersea, and you head the surgical team at St. Luke's Hospital. I do. You were the first medical man to see the deceased? I was. And you have since conducted an examination in collaboration with uh, Dr. Grimbold of Scotland Yard? I have. Are you in agreement as to the cause of death? Generally speaking, yes. Well, please tell the jury your conclusions. I was in the dissecting room at St. Luke's Hospital at about nine o'clock on Tuesday morning when Inspector Sugg told me that the dead body of a man had been discovered under mysterious circumstances at 59 Queen Caroline Mansions. I was able to assure him that there was no subject missing from the dissecting room. Uh, how did you find the body? I found the deceased lying on his back in the bath. I examined him and concluded that death had been caused by a blow on the back of the neck, dislocating the fourth and fifth cervical vertebrae, bruising the spinal cord, and producing internal hemorrhage and partial paralysis of the brain. Could the blow have been self-inflicted? Certainly not. It had been made with a heavy, blunt instrument from behind, with great force and considerable judgment. Was death instantaneous? It is difficult to say. I should be disposed to think that the deceased might have lingered for some hours. I may say, however, that Dr. Grimbold and I are not in complete agreement on this point. He thinks the man had been dead for some days. Could you uh, identify the deceased? I never saw him before. Mm. Uh, did you gather anything from the appearance of the deceased? As to his personal habits. I should say he was a man of easy circumstances who had only recently come into money. His teeth were in a bad state and his hand showed signs of recent manual labour. Uh, thank you, Sir Julian. Uh, Inspector Sugg, uh, would you tell the jury what steps have been taken to identify the deceased? Uh, <clears throat> A description has been sent to every police station and inserted in all the newspapers. Has anyone come forward to identify the body? Plenty of people have come forward, but nobody has succeeded in identifying it. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Members of the jury, you are not here to gossip as to who the deceased could or could not have been, but to give your opinion as to the cause of death. Now, I would remind you that you should consider whether, according to the medical evidence, death could have been accidental or self-inflicted, or whether it was deliberate murder or homicide. If you consider the evidence on any of these points insufficient, you may return an open verdict. <laughs> Sir Julian, I haven't seen you for ages. How are you? Hard at work. Uh, just got my new book out. Isn't it too dreadful about poor Sir Ruben? Oh, this is Mr Parker, who is investigating the case. I'm very glad to meet you. Uh, do you think Sir Ruben may be detained in the hands of some financial rival? Is that your opinion? I think it very likely. <laughs> Uh, members of the jury, are you agreed upon your verdict? <clears throat> we are. The deceased died of the effects of a blow upon the spine. We consider that there is not sufficient evidence to show how that injury was inflicted. <laughs> Uh, 
I had absolutely no idea that there was any thought of connecting this matter with the disappearance of Sir Reuben. The suggestion is absolutely monstrous. Well, that is Inspector Sugg's view. There is some resemblance between the dead man and the portraits of Sir Reuben. Only a superficial likeness. The upper part of the face is not an uncommon type, but as Sir Reuben wore a heavy beard, there is no opportunity of comparing mouths and chins. You may know, Mr. Parker, that I am an old friend of the Levies. I understood something of the sort. Yes. When I was a young man, I... In short, Mr. Parker, I hoped once to marry Lady Levy. Believe me, Sir Julian, I sympathise. I did all I could to disabuse Inspector Sugg. Unhappily, the coincidence of Sir Reuben's being seen that evening in Battersea Park Road... Sir Reuben? Yes. Someone of his description was seen by a young woman. Of, shall we say, dubious morals. Oh, these young women will say anything. <laughs> ah, here we are. Perhaps you would come in for a moment, Mr. Parker, and have a drink. Delighted, Sir Julian. Someday I shall abandon my consulting practice altogether and settle down here to cut up my subjects and write my books in peace. <laughs> Dissection is the basis of all good theory and all good correct diagnosis. Indeed, Sir Julian. Very often the only time I get for my research is at night. Doubtless your own work has to be carried on under even more trying circumstances. Yes, yeah, sometimes. But then, you see, the conditions are, so to speak, part of the work. You mean that the burglar does not demonstrate his methods in the light of day or plant the perfect footmark in the middle of a damp patch of sand for you to analyse? Exactly. <laughs> but I have no doubt that many of your diseases work quite as insidiously as any burglar. Oh, they do, they do. The neuroses, you know, are particularly clever criminals. They break out in many disguises and cover up their tracks wonderfully. When you can really investigate, Mr. Parker, and break up the dead body with the scalpel, you always find footprints, a little trail of ruin or disorder, left by madness or disease or drink or any other similar pest. You regard all these things as physical? Oh, yes. Mm. I am not ignorant of the rise of another school of thought which attributes neurosis to the mind alone, but... Its exponents are mostly charlatans or self-deceivers. <sighs> Mr. Parker, I would like to say something in connection with your present inquiry. Only I hardly... I hardly like... I to... shall be very grateful for any help you can give me. I'm afraid it's more in the nature of hindrance. It's a case of destroying a clue for you and a breach of professional confidence on my side. Please go on. On Monday night, Sir Reuben Levy came to see me. I only tell you now because you said Sir Reuben was accidentally seen in the neighbourhood and I would rather tell you in private than have you ferreting round here questioning my servants, Mr Parker. You will excuse my frankness. I hold no brief for the pleasantness of my profession, Sir Julian. Did he make an appointment? An appointment? Hmm. Oh, no. He turned up unexpectedly after dinner. He said he was worried about his health. I examined him and he left me somewhere about ten o'clock. May I ask, what was the result of your examination? Well, I will tell you in confidence that I saw grave grounds for suspicion and yet no absolute certainty of mischief. To publish the matter abroad could only harm Sir Reuben and pain his wife. You need not be afraid of your confidence getting into the records of Scotland Yard. I see that you know how to be discreet. We have our professional etiquette, Sir Julian. Lady Swaffham has telephoned, my lord. She hopes you've not forgotten your lunch appointment. The Duchess of Denver will be there. Oh, lord, I had forgotten. Um, so I'm in bed with whooping cough and ask my mother to come round after lunch. Mr Milligan will be at Lady Swaffham's, I believe. Mr who? Mr John P. Milligan, my lord. 
Good Lord, Bunter, why didn't you say so before? Right, I'm off. Uh, call me a taxi. Not in those trousers, my lord. Oh, Bunter, do let me just this once. You don't know how important it is. Not on any account, my lord. It will be as much as my place is worth. I wish to God I had never let you grow into a privileged family retainer, Bunter. Let me see, Mr Milligan. You were... Uh, now, don't tell me. A railway king, that's it. <laughs> well, now, uh, I guess it's of as much interest to us businessmen to meet British aristocrats as it is for Britishers to meet American railway kings, Duchess. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> By the way, I must thank you for a very munificent cheque for our church restoration fund. Well, we haven't any fine old buildings like yours, and it's a privilege to be allowed to help. <laughs> Oh, I hope you'll forgive me, Lady Swatham. Fact is, I had to go and see a man down in Salisbury. How do, Mother? How are you, dear? Mr Milligan and I were just talking about the church. Yes. <laughs> well, uh, tell us, Lord Peter, are you working on one of your cases at the moment? Hmm? He's investigating a mysterious body in a bath. Oh, uh, like the man who was hanged for murdering three brides in the bath, eh? Oh, I thought that was so ingenious. Mm. I got so frightened, I gave up my morning bath took to having it in the afternoon when the Duke was out. It was an uncommonly ingenious plan, only he shouldn't have repeated himself. If ever you want to commit a murder, the thing you've got to do is prevent people from associating their ideas. Wow. Most people's ideas just roll about like so many dried peas on a tray, making a lot of noise and going nowhere. For instance, Mr Milligan, I've just been down to Salisbury. I don't suppose it'd impress you much if you read in the paper tomorrow of the tragic discovery of a dead lawyer down in Salisbury? But if I went there again next week, and there was a Salisbury doctor found dead the day after, you might begin to think that I was a bird of ill omen to Salisbury residents. Oh, I dare say I should. Quite. And if you found that the lawyer and the doctor had once upon a time been in business in Poggleton on the Marsh, you begin to remember me once paying a visit to Poggleton on the Marsh a long time ago. And you look up the parish register and discover I'd been married there under an assumed name to the widow of a wealthy farmer who died suddenly of peritonitis, as certified by the doctor, after the lawyer had made a will leaving me all her money. Were you ever in Poggleton on the Marsh, Lord Peter? Uh, I don't think so. Oh, well, uh, the difficulty with this Battersea case, I guess, is that nobody seems to have any associations with the gentleman in the bath. I suppose you knew Sir Reuben Levy, Mr Milligan. Mm -hmm. I know him, I should say. I hope he's still alive somewhere. Well, I've dined with him. Uh, he and I have done our best to ruin each other, Duchess. <laughs> <laughs> if this were the States, I'd be inclined to suspect myself of having put Sir Reuben in a safe place. But uh, we can't do business that way in your old country, no man. Well, it must be exciting work doing business in America. Oh, it is. I can't wait to get back. <laughs> well, you mustn't go till after my church bazaar. Whiskey and soda, Parker. Hmm, don't mind if I do. Oh, I'm tired. Do you like your job, Parker? Yes. Yes, I do. I know it is useful, and I do it quite well. Not with inspiration, perhaps, but sufficiently well to take a pride in it. Why do you ask? Well, it's a hobby to me, you see. I took it up after the war when there seemed no point to anything. Oh, I love the beginning of a job when one doesn't know any of the people. When it comes to running down a live person, getting hanged or even quadded, poor devil, I don't see if there's any excuse for me butting in since I don't have to make my living by it. Oh, I see what you mean. And there's old Milligan, for instance. On paper, nothing would be funnier than to catch old Milligan out. Suppose old Milligan has cut Levy's throat and plunged him into the Thames. Is it my business? It's as much yours as anybody's. Having to earn a living is the only excuse there is for doing this kind of thing. If Milligan has cut poor old Levy's throat, I don't see why he should buy himself off by giving a thousand pounds to Duke's Denver Church roof. I don't want to think he has murdered Levy. Look here, Peter. Suppose you get this playing fields of Eton out of your system once and for all. If Sir Reuben has been murdered, is it a game? It is a game to me, to begin with. I go on cheerfully until I see there's somebody there to be hurt, and then I want to get out of it. That's because you want to swagger debonairly through a comedy of puppets. Or to stalk magnificently through a tragedy of human sorrows. That's childish. 
If you've any duty to society in finding out the truth about murders, you must do it in any way that comes handy. Life's not a football match. You're a responsible person. Now, let's discuss the case. Well, I'd better tell you about Crimplesham. I've checked his story and it's all correct. Do you believe the body could have been concealed in the flat? Or if there'd been any sign of Thipps' complicity in the crime, Sug would have found it. Why? Well, because he was looking for it. Hmm. I've been asking around in the city about those Peruvian oil shares. I routed out the brokers and I found one name at the back of it. Sir Reuben? No. Julian Freak. Mm. He bought a lot of shares last week and then quietly sold them out on Tuesday at a small profit. I shouldn't have thought he ever went in for that kind of game. He doesn't, as a rule. Well, people do these things just to prove that they could make a fortune if they liked. Oh, well, it's late. I'm off home. Good night, Peter. Good night. This case is a complicated riddle of which I have once been told the answer, but have then forgotten it. I brought you some cocoa, my lord. Oh, thank you. Well, go to bed, Bunter. I shall sit up a little. And I brought this from the Times Book Club, my lord. I thought you might like to see it. Physiological Basis of the Conscience by Sir Julian Freak. Thank you, Bunter. Good night, my lord. Good night, Bunter. The knowledge of good and evil is a phenomenon of the brain, a condition of the brain cells. You can carve passions in the brain with a knife. You can get rid of imagination with drugs. Well, well. Mind and matter are one thing. Conscience in man may, in fact, be compared to the sting of a bee which cannot function without occasioning its death. If humanity ever passes into a higher individualism, we may suppose that the interesting little phenomenon of conscience may gradually disappear. Just as the nerves and muscles which once controlled the movements of our ears and scalp have, in all save a few backward individuals, become atrophied and of interest only to the physiologists. By Jove, that's an ideal doctrine for the criminal. The knowledge of good and evil is a phenomenon of the brain. It is removable. 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 The knowledge of good and evil is removable. Good and evil, good and evil, good and evil, small boy with a thunderously beating heart, a great silver urn with a spirit lamp under it, an elaborate coffee pot. I twitch the corner of the tablecloth. The urn moves. The teaspoons rattle. Pull the tablecloth. Harder, harder. Urn, coffee machine, the whole of the china breakfast service crashing down. Butter! My lord, what is it? No, put that light out, damn you! Listen. Can't you hear it? Why, well, you're shivering, my lord. You go to bed and I'll fetch you a drop of brandy. No, 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 it's the water. It's up to their waists down there, poor devils. Listen, can you hear it? Tap, tap, tap. They're mining us, but I don't know where. I can't hear. I, I can't... Again. Oh, we must find it. We must stop it. Oh my God! I can't hear. I, I can't hear anything for the noise of the guns. Can't you stop the guns? It's all right, Major. Don't you worry. But I hear it. So do I. That's our own sappers at work in the communication trench. Don't you fret about that, sir. Our own sappers. Sure of that? Certain of it. Now you just come and lie down a bit, sir. Are you sure it's safe? Safe as ours is. Now come along. <sighs> I thought we'd had the last of these attacks. Been overdoing himself, bloody little fool. It's 
Sorry you've been having a bad time, old man. Peter always had nightmares when he was a little boy, you know, Mr. Parker. But he was dreadfully bad in 1918. And I suppose we really can't forget all about the war in a year or two. I think a peaceful weekend at Denver will do him good. Oh, Parker, get uh, this description of Thipps Corpse to all the workhouses, firmaries, police stations, um, YMCA's and so on in London. Mm -hmm. I have solved the Levy murder and the Battersea mystery. What? Meanwhile, you will scrape acquaintance with one of the students at St Luke's. Oh. Uh, I shall come up to town as soon as I hear from you. Do you mean you've got to the bottom of the thing? Yes. I hope I'm wrong. Is it one mystery or two? One. You talk of the Levy murder. Is Levy dead? God, yes. Come along, Peter. Oh, uh, Your overcoat, my lord. Oh, Oh, thank you, Bunter. Uh, you, you, you understand what you have to do, don't you? Perfectly, thank you, my lord. Things move in an orderly way. My mother arranges flowers. My brother Gerald reads in the library. No one dies sudden and violent deaths, except aged setters and partridges. Heel, boy! I have become acquainted with Sir Julian Freak's manservant, Mr Cummins. He belongs to the same club as the Honourable Frederick Arbuthnot's man. We dined with Mr Cummins, whom I afterwards invited to drinks and a cigar in the flat. Your Lordship will excuse my doing this, but it's always been my experience that the best way to gain a man's confidence is to let him suppose that one takes advantage of one's employer. I gave him the best old port. The devil you did. Having heard you and Mr Arbuthnot talk over it. <laughs> what on earth are you doing, Peter? Sitting there nodding and grinning like a watch of call it. <laughs> Someone writing pretty things to your wife? Yes, charming things, Gerald. <laughs> <laughs> With the second glass of port, I introduce the subject of your lordship's inquiry. You, uh... You seem to get many opportunities of seeing a bit of life, Mr Bunter. Oh, one could always make opportunities if one knows how. <laughs> Allow me. Oh, thank you. Oh, it's, it's all right for you here at Piccadilly, right on the spot, as you might say. I dare say you'd take the opportunity to slip off at night, eh? <laughs> well, what do you think, Mr Cummings? <laughs> That's it. But what's a man to do with a blasted scientific doctor for a governor? Who sits up all night, cutting up dead bodies and experimenting with frogs. I'm sure he goes out sometimes. <laughs> Not often. And always back before twelve. And the way he goes on if he rings the bell and you ain't there. Temper? No, but uh, looking through you, nasty-like, as if you was on that operating table of his and he was going to cut you up. Not that he's very correct. Apologises if he's been inconsiderate. But what's the good of that when he's been and gone and lost you your night's rest? Keeps you up late, does he? Oh. No, no. House locked up and household to bed at half past ten. Still, when I do go to bed, I like to go to sleep. Well, what's he do? Walk about the house? All night. In and out of the private door to the hospital. He'll bang the door so you can hear him all over the house. Yeah, and talking all night. Mm. And baths. Uh -huh. and... Last Monday night, Mr Bunter, he decided to have a bath at three on the clock in the morning. Don't say so, Mr Cummings. Yeah. He don't like to go to bed till he's washed the basilisses off. Of course, yeah. Sometimes they can't help themselves. Get uh, people visiting late. Well, that's true, Mr Bunter. There was a gentleman come in on Monday evening. He stayed about an hour. It may have put Sir Julian behind hand. Very likely. Some more port, Mr Cummings. Ah. Oh, a little of Lord Peter's old brandy. Oh, uh, a little of the brandy, thank you, Mr Bunter. <laughs> But Sir Julian let him out at ten o'clock. 
Now, if I had all his money, curse me if I go poking about with dead men in the middle of the night. Hey, Bunter. Description recognised. Chelsea Workhouse. Unknown vagrant. Injured street accident Wednesday week. Died Workhouse Monday. Delivered St Luke's same evening by order freak. Made the acquaintance of a medical student, a Mr Piggott. Much puzzled. Parker. Good news, old chap. Yes, marching orders back to town, Gerald. Oh. Many thanks for your hospitality, old bird. Feeling no end better. I do wish you'd keep out of the police courts. Make it so dashed awkward for me. Ah, sorry, Gerald. I know I'm a beastly blot on the escutcheon. <laughs> Why only marry and settle down and live quietly, doing something useful? Hmm? Uh, if anybody comes blackmailing you, Gerald, or your first deserted wife turns up unexpectedly from the West Indies, you'll realise the pull of having a private detective in the family. <laughs> Ah, uh, well, when you on the car. The thing I object to in detective stories is the way fellows remember every blooming thing that's happened to them in the last six months. You mean, Mr Pickett, that if I were to ask you what you were doing, say, um, a week ago today, you wouldn't be able to tell me a thing about it? Lord, no. I'll bet you half a crown to sixpence that you'll remember it within five minutes. But I'm sure I can't. Do you keep a notebook of the work you do when you dissect? Uh, drawings or anything? Oh, yes. What's the last thing you did in it? It's easy, because I only did it this morning. It was leg muscles. Turn back the pages of your drawing book in your mind. What came before that? Oh, uh, some animals. I did rather a good hare's leg and a frog's and a rudimentary leg on a snake. Do your drawings of legs begin on the right-hand page or the left-hand page? Now, let's see. The frog's hind leg is on the right-hand page. What is opposite to it? Oh, dear. Something round, coloured. Oh, yes, it's an arm. <laughs> mm. Did you make the arm drawings on Thursday? N no, I'm never in the dissecting room on a Thursday. Uh, on Wednesday, perhaps? Yes, I must have finished them on Wednesday. When had you begun them, then? Why, the day before, Tuesday. Were they a man's arm or a woman's arm? A man's arm. Last Tuesday, a week ago today, you were dissecting a man's arm in the dissecting room. <laughs> Sixpence, please. That's incredible. Oh, you know, a lot more than that. Uh, did the arm have very young, fair skin? Uh, no, no, no. O ordinary skin, I think, with dark hairs on it. Mm, a lean, stringy arm, perhaps, with no extra fat anywhere. Well, it was rather poorly developed. A sedentary man who didn't do much manual work? That's right. Was it a young man's arm? Middle-aged, with rheumatism. There was a chalky deposit in the joints, and the fingers were a bit swollen. Man about 50. About that. Who had the head? Old freak bagged the head himself. He called us up and gave us the jaw on spinal hemorrhage and nervous lesions. Was the body fit and well-fed? No. He probably came from the workhouse. Most of the bodies do. Mm. On Tuesday week, then, you were dissecting the arm muscle of a rheumatic middle-aged man of sedentary habits who died of some injury, producing spinal hemorrhage and nervous lesions and so forth, and who was presumed to come from the workhouse. Yes. I say, I did know all that, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> it seems almost incredible. Oh, there's nothing incredible in human nature. Have you got that exhumation order? Yes. You really are certain we're not making a mistake? Well, if we are, no harm will have been done. Whimsy, let's have another look at this business. We have two mysterious occurrences in one night and a chain connecting them through one particular person. It's beastly, but it's not unthinkable. I know all that. Freak has a motive for getting rid of Levy. An old jealousy. Very old. And not much of a motive. People don't keep up old jealousies for 20 years or so. Perhaps not just primitive brute jealousy. The thing that sticks is hurt vanity. And sex is every man's weak spot. What about Freak? Levy, who was nobody 20 years ago, romps in and carries off Freak's girl from under his nose. It isn't a girl Freak would bother about. It's having his aristocratic nose put out of joint. It seems very petty. Freak likes crime. In his book, the admiration simply glares out between the lines whenever he writes about a, a callous and successful criminal. He reserves his contempt for the victims or the men who get found out. He thinks conscience is a sort of a, appendix. Chop it out and you'll feel better. How did he do it, then? 
The man who got hold of the Battersea corpse had to have access to dead bodies. Freak obviously has such access. He had to be cool and quick and callous about handling a dead body. Surgeons are all that. He had to be a strong man to carry the body across the roof and dump it in Thipp's window. Freak is a powerful man. He probably wore surgical gloves. The murderer lived in the neighbourhood. Freak lives next door. What was Levy doing at Freak's on Monday night? Well, you had Freak's explanation. Well, you said yourself it wouldn't do. It won't do. Freak was lying. Why mention it at all? Because Levy had been seen at the corner of the road. Freak had to think up an explanation. Then we come back to the first question. Why did Levy go there? I don't know. But Freak expected someone and let the visitor in himself. But the caller left again at ten. Oh, Charles, I did not expect this of you. Who saw him go? No, all right then. Where was Levy? Levy went into the library and never came down. Freak put him in the bedroom next door. Do you mean to say Freak got the whole job finished before three in the morning? Why not? Quick work. Freak is a professional. Uh, what about Crimplesham's pince-nez? Mm, that's a bit mysterious. And why Thip's bathroom? Why indeed? Pure accident, perhaps, or pure devilry? Do you think all this elaborate scheme could have been put together in a night whimsy? Yeah, far from it. It was conceived as soon as that man who bore a superficial resemblance to Levy came into the workhouse. He had several days. I see. Freak gave himself away at the inquest. He and Grimbo disagreed about when the man died. If an ordinary doctor like Grimble presumes to disagree with a man like Freak, it's because he is sure of his ground. Then, if your theory is sound, Freak made a mistake. Yes, a very slight one. He was being unnecessarily cautious about raising suspicions in the mind of the workhouse doctor. What made him lose his head? A chain of unforeseen accidents. My advertisement in the Times, the connection with the Battersea end of the mystery... Seeing you talking to my mother at the inquest, his aim in life was to prevent the two cases from linking up. And there were two of the links sitting literally side by side. You were investigating Sir Reuben's disappearance, and I was investigating Thip's body. Well, well. If all this is true, I suppose I have only one course of action open to me. It affords me, if I may say so, great satisfaction that in a collaboration like ours... All the uninteresting and disagreeable routine work is done by you. Well, do you anticipate any difficulty about the warrant? No. Then I shall leave that part of it to you. I shall settle down, finally, to a perusal of my Dante. After I have made a visit. Well, Lord Peter, there's nothing physically wrong with you, but you've certainly been working far too hard. Ah. Tell me again what happened. You were sitting in the dark. Were you warm? I think the fire had died down. My man tells me that my teeth were chattering. You live in Piccadilly? Yes. Heavy traffic sometimes goes past in the night, I expect. Oh, frequently. You had these attacks in 1918? Yes, I was very ill for some months. Since then, they've occurred less frequently? Well, much less frequently. When did the last occur? About um, nine months ago. Under what circumstances? I was worried by family matters. You were interested last year, I think, in some police case. It's in the recovery of Lord Attenborough's emerald necklace, yes. Mm. That must have involved some severe mental exercise. Oh, I suppose so, but I enjoyed it very much. You were interested, but not distressed? Exactly, Ah, oh, Lord Peter, I'll tell you about yourself in quite untechnical language. Oh, thanks. I'm an awful fool about long words. <laughs> you know quite well that the war has left its mark on you in what I may call old wounds in your brain. Sensations received by your nerve endings send messages to your brain and produce minute physical changes. These changes in their turn set up sensations which we call horror fear, sense of responsibility, and so on. Yes, I follow you. Very well. Now, if you stimulate these damaged places in your brain, you run the risk of opening up the old wounds. Dread of German mines, responsibility for the lives of your men, strained attention, and the ability to distinguish small sounds through the overpowering noise of guns. I see. This effect would be increased by extraneous circumstances. 
producing other familiar physical sensations. Night, cold, or the rattling of heavy traffic, for instance. Any of these could lead you to imagine you were still at war. Yes. The old wounds are nearly healed, but not quite. The ordinary exercise of your mental faculties has no bad effect. It is only when you excite the injured part of your brain. You must learn to be irresponsible, Lord Peter. Oh, my friends say I'm too irresponsible already. A sensitive, nervous temperament often appears so, owing to its mental nimbleness. <clears throat> I will give you something to strengthen your nerves. Oh, well, thank you, Sir Julian. Now, if you will roll up your sleeve. This is just our dean. Give me your arm. Uh, what's that you're going to stick into me? You've had this kind of thing before, I expect. Oh, yes, I've had an injection before. And, you know, I, I don't care frightfully about it. Oh, oh dear. Ah, clumsy of me. As you like, of course, Lord Peter. I'm afraid I'm rather a silly ass, but I never could abide the little gadgets. Oh, dear. It's broken. In that case, it would be better not to have the injection. Just do what you can to lessen any immediate strain. Oh, yes, I'll, I'll take it easy, thanks. I'm much obliged to you. An open grave to your right. Freshly turned clay. Oh. Steady on, old man. Uh, where is Lady Levy? In the mortuary. The Duchess of Denver's with her. Your mother is wonderful, Peter. Here we are. Dante's demons working with pitchforks. I mean shovels. Hey, steady, man. The coffin. Right, your sir. You go ahead with the lantern. We'll follow you. More graves. Crooked headstones. Rough grass. This way, gentlemen. Mother step. The mortuary. Red brick and sizzling gas jets. Two women in black. Dr. Grimbold. Easy now. Be careful with the chisel. Not much substance to these here boards, sir. Hush, oh, Steve, you mustn't cry. The Dante demons depart. Good, decent demons in corduroy. Uh, it would be better, I think, if the lamp was on this side. Ah, thank you, that's excellent. The sudden, brilliant circle of an electric lamp over the table. Dr. Grimbold's beard and spectacles. Parker, bending close. The rest of the room in the enhanced darkness of the gas jets and the fog. Lady Levy has told us what to look for. Ah, yes. The lower jaw, the last tooth but one, filled with gold. A three-cornered scar, uh, just above the left elbow, and a mole. Ah, uh, yes, I see. <laughs> just as you described them all, Lady Levy. Uh, thank you. Tell, please, to cover the head. Come along, Christine. It's all over now. Are your men ready, Charles? Yes. Saggy's going with them. Sarg? Yes. Poor devil. They had him up on the mat at headquarters for bungling the case. All that evidence of Thipps about the nightclub was corroborated, you know. It may do Sug some good to be at the death, as it were. Yes, well, it doesn't matter. Whoever goes won't get there in time. Sug, my lord. Gentlemen, we've got our man. Oh. Well done, Inspector Sug. We were just in time. He was in his library writing. 
And when he saw us, he made a grab for his hypodermic, but we were too quick for him, my lord. He's actually in jail, then? Oh, safe enough. Congratulations, Inspector. Have a drink. Oh, thank you, my lord. Uh, Freak was writing a full confession addressed to your lordship. Uh, the police will have to have it, of course, but uh, I brought it along for you to see first. Oh, thanks. I'd like to hear it, Charles. Oh, rather. Very well. Dear Lord Peter, of all human emotions, emotions except perhaps except those, perhaps of, hunger those and fear, of hunger and fear, the sexual, the sexual appetite, appetite produces, the most, produces the most violent reactions. I have been planning this event for years, ever since Christine married another man. To my lust for revenge, I have added to the painstaking care of the scientist. I have studied criminology, fiction and fact, and seen how in every murder the crux of the problem is in the disposal of the body. As a doctor, the means of death are always available to me. The week before Sir Rubin's disappearance, I saw an unknown vagrant who had been heavily struck on the back of the neck, dislocating the fourth and fifth cervical vertebrae and heavily bruising the spinal cord. It was highly unlikely he would recover. The man's superficial resemblance to Sir Rubin suited my purpose very well. At the end of that week, I bought, anonymously, the stock of certain Peruvian oil fields. On Monday morning, the market in Peruvians opened briskly. Rumours had evidently got about that somebody knew something. I bought a couple of hundred more shares in my own name. At lunchtime, I made sure I ran into Levy and took him to lunch. How are things with the exchange? Uh, all right. Didn't know you were interested. I have a little flutter occasionally. I plan to make a good bit on Peruvian oil. Really? Mm. Hasn't paid a dividend for umpteen years. I've got inside information. More wine. <clears throat> Look, I don't mind doing you and Christine a good turn. No, I'm a cautious bird, you know. I'd like a bit of proof. <laughs> of course. Come round to my place tonight after dinner and I'll show you the report. Any time after nine. Don't tell anyone that you're coming. I want everyone to get in on it. My vagrant at the workhouse died at about 11 o'clock and was delivered to the hospital. In the afternoon, I had tea with an old friend and saw him off by the 5.35 from Victoria. On the way home, I discovered somebody's gold-rimmed pince-nez caught in the astrakhan collar of my overcoat. Levy arrived just after nine, and we went up to the library, where I struck him heavily with the poker just above the fourth cervical. It was delicate work, calculating the exact force necessary to kill him without breaking the skin. Just before ten, I went downstairs, let myself out, shouting good night. I walked down the street, went in by the hospital door, and returned to the house by way of the private passage. When the servants had gone to bed, I wheeled Levy to the hospital and substituted him for my interesting corpse. I wheeled my pauper back to the house. It was now five past eleven. I carried the body to my bedroom and put it into the bed. I stripped and put on Levy's clothes, not forgetting to take his spectacles. I took my own clothes with me in a suitcase and reached 9A Park Lane just after midnight. I let myself in with Levy's key. In the bedroom, I took off Levy's gloves and put on a surgical pair. 
The surest and simplest method of making a thing appear to have been done is to do it. I simply went to bed. At one o'clock I got up, dressed in my own clothes, and took a cab home. The harder part of my task still lay before me. I had to alter the appearance of my subject. A clean shave, a little hair oiling, and manicuring seemed sufficient. I went to the bathroom, turned on the hot and cold taps, and pulled out the plug. The system was in excellent form, honking, whistling, and booming like a railway terminus. Under cover of this sound, I took the body up to the roof. The rest was simple. I carried my pauper along the flat roof, intending to leave him on someone's staircase. I saw an open window just below me. I knew it was either a bathroom or a kitchen. I lowered the corpse by the aid of bandages and a drain pipe, and soon hauled him into Thip's bathroom. By that time, I was rather pleased with myself. And a sudden inspiration suggested that I should give him the pair of pince-nez I had happened to pick up in Victoria. I fixed them on him, and departed as I had come. Next morning, I sold my Peruvian stock on a rising market, and I supervised the dissection of Sir Rubin's body. My will is made, leaving my money to St Luke's Hospital, and bequeathing my body to the same institution for dissection. I feel sure that my brain will be of interest to the scientific world, as I shall die by my own hand. Will you do me the favour of seeing that my brain is not damaged by an unskilful practitioner at the post mortem? Had you submitted to the injection I offered you, Lord Peter, you would, of course, never have reached home alive. And here the manuscript breaks off. Well, that's all clear enough. Isn't it odd? All that coolness, all those brains, and he couldn't resist writing the confession to show how clever he was. And a very good thing for us. But uh, Lord bless you, sir, these criminals are all alike. <laughs> Freak's epitaph. What next, Peter? I shall give a dinner party for Mr. John P. Milligan and Mr. Crimplesham. I feel they deserve it for not having murdered Levy. Oh, don't forget the Thips and your mother. Oh, no account would I deprive myself of the pleasure of their company. Bunter, my lord, the Napoleon brandy, if you please. Oh, <laughs> that sounds good. Now, well yes. done, sir. Oh, well done, sir. In Whose Body by Dorothy L. Sayers, Gary Bond was Lord Peter Whimsey, John Cater, Bunter, Roger Rowland, Mr. Parker, and Michael Graham Cox, Sir Julian Freak. Vida Warwick was the Dowager Duchess, Terry Malloy, John P. Milligan, Gerald Duke of Denver, and Inspector Sugg, Jeff Searle, the Coroner, Graves, and Sir Reuben Levy, and Tim Brierley, Freddie Arbuthnot, and Cummings. Christopher Benjamin was Mr. Crimplesham, the foreman and the sexton, Kim Durham, Mr. Thipps, Dr. Grimbold and the waiter, Charlotte Martin, Gladys Horrocks and Lady Levy, and Alex Jones, Mr. Piggott, whose body was dramatised by Micheline Wanda and directed in Pebble Mill by Vanessa Whitburn. Double Negative by John Penn, dramatised by Melville Jones, with John Castle as Thorne, Andrew Branch as Abbott, Michael Cochran as Dr. Avery, Benjamin Whitrow as Professor Quentin Woods, and Jonathan Taffler as Peter Cousins. The action of the play takes place in and around Oxford.
Cousins and Tim's. Peter Cousins phone. Can I help you? No, I'm afraid Mr. Cousins is out of the office at the moment, but he should be back any minute. Oh, well, if you'd like to give me details of the property, I... I'm Kate Minden, and I... Oh, I see. Of course. No, I understand. Well, I'm sure he'd be pleased to handle the sale. Yes, North Oxford is a popular area. Right, I'll tell him you'll call again after the weekend. Thank you. Chauvinist. Why does it always rain for the weekend? Someone's law, isn't it? Everyone deserted you? I'll let the girls go. They were just sitting looking at the clock. Friday night fever. I can almost remember it. But you stayed. Commendable loyalty in my office manager. I thought you might bring the photographs. And you were right. You have a gift. I know. I'm wasted here. Amazing. What? You even make that bungalow in Wheatley look attractive. Oh, I'm proud of that one. It was a challenge. I've got in all of the garden and none of the motorway. Cut for you. Mm, two sugars. I'll put these in the folders. I leave it. Monday will do. But I stay. You work too hard. I've told you before. Not really. Anyway, I enjoy it. I know. I noticed. Kate, I've been giving some thought to your future here. Oh, have you? Yes. And I believe you'd make an excellent partner. But... Business partner, of course. Although if it wasn't for your boyfriend in Reading... You really think it's a possibility? Yes. I'll try to get something down in writing over the weekend, what's involved and so on. If you're interested. Of course I'm interested. I'm delighted. Good. Well, why don't we celebrate? I'll buy you a real drink, but in this boring instant... No, instance. sorry, I have to get off. Shame. Off to that lucky fellow in Reading, is it? Well, something like that. I hope he appreciates you. Look, at least let me give you a lift into town. Save you getting wet. No need to bother, Peter, really. It's no bother. It's a pleasure, Kate. You know that. Well, it's out of your way. Not at all. I'm off to the cottage for the weekend. Away from it all. That'll be nice. Very. I'll take you there one day. Oh, don't look so worried. All respectable and above board. Trust me, Kate. After all, we are going to be partners. I thought you said this was a shortcut, Abbott. It usually works, sir. Must be roadworks. Must it. It's history, Sergeant. What is? This. Oxford was not built for the motor car. Not on a wet Friday evening. Where are they all going? Home to their loved ones, Abbott. Unlike some of us. Come on, sir. It's my first weekend off since Christmas. Well deserved, I'm sure. What will you do? Going away. Weekend break. Quite reasonable. Somewhere exotic? Chip in Camden. Very adventurous. Must be all of 30 miles away. Lovely, though. Oh, it's nothing like our Cotswolds at this time of the year. Think of me, toiling over this art theft business, telling the chief constable we've made nil progress in several thousand carefully selected words. You're not enjoying this one, are you, sir? Ten out of ten, I bet. <laughs> Crimes without victims. Boring. What about the owners of the paintings? Am I supposed to bleed because one rich collector steals from another? Who loses? The insurance company. <laughs> Them, they never lose. Oh, that last movement... Round here, the gallery's just past the corner. Nowhere to park. Oh, for God's sake, use the double yellow line, Sergeant. But last if you get a ticket, send it to the Chief Constable. At least we'll be wasting our time at his expense. Yeah. Call for you, Mr. Cousin. Well, who is it? I said I didn't want any calls. Uh, she didn't say. Any sign of Kate yet? No, not yet. Where the hell is she? Shall I put the call through? Yeah, right. Uh, Peter Cousins here. Can I help? Oh, no, I'm afraid not. I don't know where she is. She hasn't contacted us yet. No, I'm sure she will. She's very conscientious. No, well, perhaps it's the traffic, or she could be ill, I suppose. I'll get her to call you, shall I? Right. And that's an Abingdon number. And and who shall I say is... Hello? Hello? Mind if I join you? Sir? Uh, of course not. 
But I'm not lively company, Albert. Oh, bad, was it, sir? Not good. We have to try harder. Get a result. Painstaking investigation. Every cliche in the book. You left out attention to detail. I don't know why he doesn't just switch on a recorded message. Oh, uh, pass the sauce, will you, sir? A plate full of chips drowned in gravy and sauce. Weekend away seems to have sharpened your appetite. Oh, it's great. We did a lot of walking. Good. You can do some more this afternoon round the art dealers and antique shops. Here, have a long list. Mm, right. Oh, oh, good. There's one in Summertown. I'm calling out the state agents, too. Buying a house? No, I just passed it on. Missing girl, not turned up for work. On Monday, thousands don't turn up for work. Oh, seems to be a bit more to it than that, sir. There'd better be more to it, Sergeant. Your time is precious to me at the moment. Don't waste it, yes, I know. So I hope you don't think I'm wasting your time, Sergeant. Not at all, sir. Now, you say you've contacted her landlady? Yes, Kate left there Friday morning and hasn't been back. Is that unusual? Not really, it seems. She was away most weekends. With this boyfriend in Reading? I suppose so. Only suppose? Well... Yes, sir? You see, I don't know if there really is a boyfriend. Oh? It has become a sort of a joke. She never denied it. Or confirmed it? No. In fact, she didn't expand much on the subject at all. Shy, perhaps? No, uh, I don't think that. What, then? You'd better tell me, sir. It was just an area of her life she didn't want to talk about, I suppose. You don't know much about her life outside of work, do you, sir? No. Why should I? <laughs> Quite. But it doesn't give us much to go on if she doesn't turn up. I suppose not. Well, I shouldn't worry yet. Probably a simple explanation usually is. But it's so unlike her. Kate's conscientious, reliable. This is quite out of character. That's why I'm so concerned. Yeah, I understand. Well, uh, we'll circulate a description. And if I could take this photograph. Very striking-looking girl, isn't she? Her hair. Yes. She's beautiful. And you took this, you say? Yes, Sergeant, for publicity purposes. You know, staff line-ups in the local papers, that sort of thing. Oh, I see. Uh, well, we'll keep in touch, Mr Cousins, and you'll let us know if she turns up here. Of course. Hope to God she does. And in the meantime, if you remember anything else, friends, places you might have gone, anything like that, you'll give me a ring? Of course. Funny, isn't it? How little you really know about people. People you think you're close to. Yes, sir. It is quite odd. They do know we're coming, I hope. I don't want to spend the afternoon hanging around a bus station. Yes, sir. I spoke to the traffic manager. Good. If she caught a bus to Reading, the driver should remember her, especially if this photograph is a true likeness. The girls in the office say it is. That's about all they did say. Afraid so. Uh, she kept herself to herself. And she'd been there nearly a year. True. Something of a loner. The landlady said the same. You know what these bed sits are like. Pay the rent and nobody really cares if you're dead or alive. Now, she did confirm she was away every weekend. Ah, the elusive boyfriend? Yeah, I suppose so. Only suppose, Abbott. Oh, no one ever saw him. Cousins thinks it could have been an office joke. But she was going to Reading last Friday when Cousins dropped her at the bus station. That's what I'm assuming. That's why we need to check. So, Cousins was the last person to see her, then? Yes. And I've checked all the hospitals in a 30-mile radius. She's not been in an accident. Check the morgues? Of course, but I thought you said I wasn't... I did. I'm sure Miss Kate Minden has simply gone off on some private pleasure trail. But... It has been four days. Cousins have started pestering me. Not just you, Abbott. Word has reached our beloved leader. Oh, no. Hence, Merivale's decision that I can be spared for a few hours from the world of fine art. He wants a result here as well. My God, Abbott. Aren't bus stations depressing places? Long lines of people staring into space. Well, off you go. Talk to our traffic manager, friend. Well? Uh, he says the driver's over there. Stand seven. Come on, then. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, this is bit seven. Here we are. Excuse me. You can't get on here. You have to wait Police. Now. What? Police. Detective Sergeant Abbott, and this is Detective Superintendent Thorne. Oh. You'd better come on, then. Thank you. Right. So, how can I help you? We understand you took out the 5.30 to Reading last Friday, is that correct? Yeah, that's right. Bitch of a night, wasn't it? Tipping it down, hate driving in those conditions. Just have a look at this photograph, please. Ah. Hmm. Recognise her? Oh, yeah. I remember. <laughs> Who wouldn't? Real looker, isn't she? So she was a passenger on your bus last night? Oh, Friday. no, not on my bus. Not to Reading. But you said you remember her. Yeah. 
I do. I thought of myself, you get that lovely air of yours all wet standing out in the rain. Standing? Standing where? Well, out there at the Abingdon stop, where she always stood. Always? Oh, yeah, regular clockwork. Friday nights. Often past her there. You see, I go out ten minutes before the Abingdon. And, and she was then... definitely there last Friday. Yeah, like I say, in the rain. That's how I remember. Who was driving the Abingdon bus last Friday? Do you remember? Friday. Uh, let's see. Yeah, that would have been Dickie Marshall. <laughs> you check with him. He'll remember her all right. No doubt about that. Here you are, Gov. Two teas with sugar. Cheers. Hardly a productive afternoon. No, sir. Except we know she didn't go to Reading. Not by bus, anyway. Nor to Abingdon, not last Friday. But that's where she usually went. She was quite a regular. All we've established is that she was waiting at the Abingdon stop at about 5.30, but she wasn't there when the bus arrived ten minutes later. Yeah. Did she think someone gave her a lift? I don't know. Perhaps she just got fed up standing in the rain. And went off somewhere. Why? Caught a later bus. Why not? That's what I would have done. Yeah. But then what? Speculation, Abbott. Let's stick to what we know. Which is? Two copies. That Kate Minden commuted to Abingdon at the weekend. And not to the boyfriend in Reading. Hmm. But what she does in Abingdon, we... Hey, wait a minute, there was a call. What call? Cousins mentioned it. There'd been a call for her on Monday morning from someone in Abingdon. But they didn't leave a name. Very helpful. But there was a number. I think it's in the farm. For God's sake, why haven't you checked it out? Well, Cousins assumed it was probably one of her clients. But he wasn't sure. No. I would have thought with so little to go on, you might have followed up on a possible lead, however small. I suppose I was concentrating on the boyfriend in Reading, that angle. Sorry, sir. The boyfriend could be in Abingdon. It could have been him on the phone. Oh, no. You sound very certain. It was a woman. Cousins said it was a woman. Right drink up and let's move, Sergeant. We'll go by the bypass. It'll be quicker. The bypass? We're going to Abingdon, Abbott. I'll call up on the radio and by the time we get there we shall have the address to match the number in your file, okay? <clears throat> let's hope she's in. There's someone coming. Good afternoon, Mrs. Richards. Yes, uh, who is it? Detective Superintendent Thorne, and this is Detective Sergeant Abbott. Oh, yes, of course. I, I was expecting you sooner or later. Really? Oh, yes. May we come in for a moment? Well, I have to meet Zelda soon. Zelda? My granddaughter. I meet her from school. Uh, we won't keep you long, Mrs. Richards. Oh, better come through. Thank you very much. Uh, this way, please. Uh, oh, I'm oh, <laughs> Boy, I'm sorry about the mess. Uh, Zelda's got all her paints out. I know what it's like, Mrs. Richards. I've got a six-year-old. Oh, have you? Yeah. Zelda's something in the house. Oh. Good as gold, really. You wouldn't know she was in the house. She lives with you? Yes. I thought you knew. I found out somehow. May we, uh, sit down? Oh. There are some questions. I'm sorry, of course. Oh, I'm in such a state. I'm so worried. Just, uh, I put the books on the floor. Abbott. Yes, sir? Books. On the floor. Ah, yes, sir. She is all right, isn't she? Nothing has happened to her, has it? Happened to who, Mrs. Richards? To Kate, of course. But that is why you're here, isn't it? May I ask why you're so concerned about Miss Minden? Concerned? My daughter goes missing. Your daughter? Well, yes, I, I thought you must know. Otherwise, why are you here? You made a call to your daughter's office on Monday morning, Mrs. Richards? Oh, yes. <laughs> She told me never to call, but I was so worried. Do you know why she told you she didn't want you to call? Because they didn't know about Zelda. That's why I haven't been to the police myself. I just kept hoping from... Is Zelda to... Kate's daughter? Yes. Yes. Why does it have to be a secret, Mrs. Richards? Well, I know it must sound stupid, but Kate insisted. She said, if you're a single parent, employers don't take you seriously. She's very ambitious, you see. So you look after Zelda whilst your daughter acts out the life of a single woman in Oxford. Well, Kate's very conscientious. She comes home every weekend. I love Zelda. But this is her place, you see. She's my life now, Mrs. No. Lieutenant, since my husband died. Nearly two years ago. Ah, oh, she's very pretty. <laughs> And Zelda's father? Oh, Dad. He's dead. So you and your daughter are both widows? Oh, yes. Well, that's why we set up house together. I hope this doesn't sound tactless, Mrs. Richards, but I have to ask if we were to find Kate. Does your daughter have anyone else in her life? A special friend, perhaps? No, or a... uh, she didn't want that. Not after 
Not after what she'd been through. Oh, of course, but she's young, attractive. I wondered whether she mentioned anyone to you. Well, I'm sure there's plenty you'd like to take up with her. That boss, for one. Peter Cousins? Yes, he's asked her out, but she puts him off. But there's no one else, you're sure? I told you. Why'd you ask that? What's happened? You tell me what's happened. She's all right, isn't she? Please tell me she's all right. Well, I'm not convinced. Not by that charade. But if the girl is really ambitious, it makes sense. You know what it's like for working mothers and a single parent. The world is full of single parents, Abbott. Hardly a rare species. So why else would she be so secretive? I don't know. Besides, I don't suppose it matters. What? Kate Minden is playing some kind of a game, isn't she? It doesn't seem out of character that she should decide to take herself off somewhere. But it might have got her into trouble. Danger, even. (laughs) You think she might be lying in a ditch somewhere? It's possible. Of course it's possible, but is it probable? Some bloke could have picked her up at the bus... One of the things we know for certain about Kate Minden is that she's intelligent and disciplined. She doesn't sound the sort to take lifts from strange men in the middle of Oxford on a busy Friday evening, does she? So what do we do next? You, Sergeant, not we. I can't spend more time on this, not on a missing person. It's back to missing paintings, far more important in Merivale's eyes. But if it was more serious... I'm sure... I hope it won't be. Difficult to know what more I can do at the moment. One, find out about the late Mr. Minden. Two, obtain details from the marriage certificate. His family, friends, might give you a lead where she could have gone. Hmm, Sounds like a lot of paperwork. You asked what you should do. Painstaking investigation, attention to detail. And no shortcuts, no shortcuts. Play it by the book. Mm. Haven't you finished that yet? Yeah, nearly there. How many sees in Picasso? Just the one. And only one K in Constable. What? Joke. Ah. Yes? Oh, um... Sorry, sir. Urgent file for Sergeant Abbott. Oh, from the Met. Thanks, Harry. It's okay. Aha, here we are. And there he is. Stephen Wayne Minden. Oh, a nasty looking piece of work, isn't he? Oh, I knew it was all a charade. Widowed indeed. I suppose he was taken from her, in a manner of speaking. Yes, not interred, but interned. Released on parole four weeks ago, only served three years. You yeah, know how they shovel them out. Good for home office statistics. Yeah, there was a lot of money on that job. None of it recovered. Quite, so perhaps Kate thought it was time for a reconciliation. But well, they were separated before he went inside. Their friends from the old days told me that. Maybe, but they also told you how ambitious she was, tight with money, didn't they? Yes, but all put aside for the little girl. So perhaps she wants to send Zelda to Rodine. Oh, I agree it fits. She couldn't tell anybody, so she just takes off after the money. And I've no doubt she'll come back for Zelda in a few days' time and they'll all live happily ever after. Yeah. Sir, you were right then, sir. Nobody's in ditches. And we must be grateful for that. Right, Abbott, pass what you've got onto the Met. Yeah. They can try chasing the money. We have other priorities, I'm afraid. Mm, art treasures. At least I can tell Merivale we seem to have got a result with the Minden girl, can't I? Yes, I suppose so. Come on, come on. And about time, Brian Doyle. About time. You made it, then? What's it look like? What did he tell him this time? Uh, That I was going to see Sarah to discuss the biology essay. (laughs) We'll have our own biology lesson, eh? In Copley Wood. Oh, stop it, Brian. Don't talk like that. You know you like it. Come oh, here. Not now. Someone could see us. Come on. Oh, you speak a beer. Just a pint or two. Get me going. Nasty rough, aren't I? You should listen to your dad, you know. If we're going somewhere, let's go. I, I've got to get back. Right. Dying for it, aren't you? Well, jump up then. You know where to hang on. That's it. Nice and tight. <clears throat> Oh, 
Morning, sir. Have you got a minute? Not really, Abbott, but come in anyway. I'm up to my eyes in Van Dyke's. Yes, what is it? Another missing girl, sir. Sergeant Morris oh, of Columbia just called Oh, for God's sake, Abbott. If you're going to pester me every time some restless adolescent goes missing... Yes, she is, too. What? An adolescent, almost 17. Well, they always are. It's a restless age. They end up sleeping in cardboard boxes in London. It's a sad fact of life, man. I do know that, sir. Yes, well, I'm sorry, but... I wouldn't have bothered you with it, but there are similarities. Similarities? That's why Sergeant Morris at Columbia got onto us. Oh, at least he's one of our brighter country cousins. He was struck by the physical similarities, too. Look, sir. Hmm. Pretty girl. Who is she? Mary Rush, only daughter, a very respectable family. Well, it doesn't mean Mary shares their moral outlook, does it? She was doing her A-levels. Quiet, steady worker. I think you should hear what Morris told me. All right, tell me about it. She went out a couple of evenings ago to see a school friend. At least that's what she told her dad. But it wasn't the truth. No. It seems she was going out with a local yobbo, Brian Doyle. He's got a bit of minor form, raves, drugs, punch-ups, that sort of stuff. Oh, yes, one of the new rural pursuits. So what does friend Doyle say for himself? He admits picking her up. Says they went to Copley Wood. It's a local beauty spot. I had a picnic there once. With banana sandwiches, I'm sure. Get to the point, Abbott. What happened in Copley Wood? Doyle says they had a quarrel and she ran off. Is that all? Yes. The local police have searched the wood. No sign of her. No sign of a struggle. Neighbours say that Doyle came back at the time he said. I see. She just vanished in the wood. Is that what you're saying? Sergeant Morris can't make any sense of it. That's why he got into us. That and, as I say, the similarity with Kate Minden. The long hair. The long auburn hair, yes. Morris remembered Kate Minder's photograph. We circulated it to all stations. Coincidence, Abbott. Besides, we can explain why Kate Minton disappeared. We think we can, but we could be wrong, sir. No one has seen her for ten days now. And you think we're wrong? That I'm wrong? Well, I, I don't know. I'm just not sure. If it will put your mind at rest, I think we could clear this one up pretty quickly. How? Doyle. He needs leaning on. Morris wouldn't know how to handle that. I think if Doyle was asked the right questions in the right way, he could tell us exactly why he quarrelled with Mary Rush. Look, how many more times I've told you everything? No, I don't think so, Mr Doyle. I have. No, I want to go away right, you know. But why should she run away? What did you do to Mary Rush, Mr Doyle? Nothing. She ran away from nothing? Just a quarrel. I told old Chubby Chops You Morris. told who? Old Morris. I told Sergeant Morris that we had a quarrel. What about? I said, what about? Tell me what you argued about. Well, she didn't want... Well, she said it wasn't... What didn't she want? Tell me. You know. Sex. She didn't want you to have sex with her. Is that it, Mr. Doyle? Yes. Had sex with a lot of girls, have you? Had you made love to Mary before? An easy lay, was she? Well... No, not all the way, you know. I see. She was a virgin, was she? Well, I don't know. <sighs> yes, I suppose so. So you tried to rape her, didn't you? No, it wasn't and like And she that. resisted, fought and screamed, didn't oh. she? That's when you lost control, when you tried to silence her. Did you put your hands over her mouth? Is that what you did, Mr. Doyle? I didn't do anything. You're strong, aren't you? Wouldn't take much to stop her, to shut her up, to oh, shut her up for good, keep wrong. her quiet, stop her saying anything. No, I've told you how it was. You've got no right to... Stop. I have every right. Don't you forget that, boy. Abbott, just remind me what Mr. Doyle told Sergeant Morris in his original statement. Uh, here we are. Uh, we kissed and fooled about a bit, but she got a bit edgy. That's how it was. Be quiet. Carry on, Abbott. She said she thought someone was watching us. Who was watching you? Did you see anyone? No. I told her she was just imagining it. And according to you, that's when she ran off? Yes. And didn't you run after her? Well, not for a bit. I thought she was just messing about. And then? Well, after a minute or two, I went looking for her. But she'd vanished into thin air. You asking us to believe that? Well, the woods are thick there. You can hide easy. That's what you thought she was doing, playing hide-and-seek? After you just tried to rape her? I didn't. Don't you say that. So where had she gone, then, Doyle? I don't know. Well, perhaps in a car. Car? I told Sergeant Morris. I thought I might have heard a car drive off. Thought you might have. You're making that up, aren't you? It's rubbish. No. It was faint, but I'm pretty sure. Well, she might have got in it. On the other hand, she might not. She might still be in Copley Wood, exactly where you left her. There you go, sir. Pint of our special. Oh, uh, thank you, Albert. Hmm, nice place, this. Yeah. Mary and I come out here for a drink some weekends. Oh, that's good. Shame you're driving, Albert. Yes, sir. 
Uh, if the lemonade's cold. I needed that. Well, what do we make of our yobbo friend? He didn't admit to anything, did he? Oh, I hardly expected him to, did you? I really thought... Look at the facts. They've been through Copley Wood with a tooth comb. Not a thing. There are several neighbours who report Doyle coming home on his motorbike at the time he said, acting and looking quite normal. Hardly the demeanour of a man who just raped, murdered and buried Mary Rush. So what did happen, sir? Well, probably like he said, he went too far, she got scared and ran off. And then? Who can say? Ah, it seems she comes from a strict home, very religious parents. Perhaps she felt ashamed, dirty, couldn't face them. Huh? I expect she'll show up in a day or two, they usually do, you know. So, just another teenage runner, then? Hmm. And no connection with Kate Minden. Not even with the physical similarities. Good figures, long red hair. Well, there's nothing else to link them, is there? And they both had reasons to take off. Kate to find her former husband. And Mary Rush? What was she running from? Her parents have it. Domestic restraints. You wait until your daughter grows up a bit. Oh, thanks. Now, two disappearances are probably coincidence. Show me a third, and I'll begin to get worried. Just try to keep the weight off it for a day or two, Mrs. James. There's nothing broken. Excuse me, Dr. Avery, can you take a call? Uh, who is it, nurse? Linda Jackson. All right. Um, if you just carry on with the bandaging. Uh, I won't be a moment. <clears throat> Linda, I thought I told you... No, no, no don't worry. I, I guess it must be important. <laughs> well, that is important. Yeah, I got it. Um, turn down to regular two. Yeah, regular two. And put on the bottom shelf. Fine. I'll get a bottle of wine on the way home. Hmm? Uh, what time's your tutorial? Who, who's it with? Oh, Quentin Woods, eh? Well, don't drink too much of his sherry. You know how he fancies you. Yeah, bye, darling. See you later. Please, just a small one. Not driving, are you? Only a bike. Well, then. There you are. One modest tot. Thank you. Oh, hardly modest. Shallow draughts intoxicate the brain. And drinking largely sobers us again. <laughs> Pope? Yes, well done. Your erudition never fails to delight me, Linda Jackson. I'll drink to it and your research project. <laughs> oh. You really think it's taking shape? Absolutely. In fact, I'm very impressed. Yours is an incisive and original mind. Well, I... Beauty, too. A rare combination, my dear. That's the sherry talking, I think. Oh, you're far too modest. I, I believe you have a very bright future. Possibly even here, in this college. The research fellowship? You think there's a chance? Oh, yes, indeed I do. Of all my postgraduate students, you, my dear Linda, are the shining star. I am whispering your glory at high table. Notice is being taken. I hadn't dared to hope. Hmm. I'd give anything to stay in Oxford. Well, I'll do what I can, trust me. You're very kind. It's my pleasure. Uh, please don't think me rude, but I really should go. Oh, uh, so soon? If you'd finished with my essays. Uh, oh, yes. Uh, they're, um, <clears throat> they're on the table uh, somewhere. Here we are. Thank you. Oh, this is new, isn't it? When did you take this? Mm -hmm. The baby. Um, yes, amusing, isn't it? Do, do you like it? Yes, it's fun. What's <laughs> it hard, sir? Well, uh, well, getting the child to keep still, you mean, to keep looking at the camera. And to tolerate that huge satin bow round its middle. Oh, she loved it. I, I must have a way with children. Who is it? Uh, my granddaughter. I hate to admit. Granddaughter? Mm. You hardly seem old enough. No, kind of you, my dear, but I... I fear so. Time's winged chariot hurrying near and all that. For all of us, Linda. Even for you. <laughs> Time's winged chariot. Dr. Avery? Here, please. Detective Superintendent Thorne, this is Detective Sergeant Abbott. Uh, come in, please. Uh, in there, if you will. You're the one in charge, aren't you? The missing that's Jones. right. I read it in the paper, so that's why I specifically asked for you. I understand your concern, Doctor, but there may be no connection. If I could just establish some facts, perhaps. Yes, of course, I'm so sorry. Uh, please do sit down. Oh, thank you, sir. I I'm just not thinking straight, I 
I've been up all night just walking around looking for her. I, I thought perhaps she'd had an accident, been knocked off a bike or something. But she hasn't. We've checked. So where is she? I have to ask you this, Dr. Avery. You haven't quarrelled with your fiancé, had you? She might... No. We were planning a celebration dinner. What were you celebrating? Uh, my birthday. I see. We've been looking forward to it. You see, I, I sleep at the hospital most nights when I get any sleep. But not last night? No, I have a couple of days off. And when you're not at the hospital, you share this flat with Miss Jackson, is that it? Yes. Helps Linda with the rent. I'm sure. Who else lives in the house, do you know? The landlord. Well, well landlady, actually. A, a Miss Foyle. Just her? No, she has a companion, Miss Gower. They have the upstairs between them. Have you asked if either of them saw Linda come or go yesterday? No, I, I didn't think to. I, well, we don't have much to do with them. Abbott, perhaps you could just nip upstairs. Yes, when did you last see your fiancé, Dr. Avery? We spoke on the telephone yesterday afternoon. And she seemed perfectly normal, not stressed. Quite the opposite. She left instructions about dinner. We joked a bit about Quentin. Quentin? Uh, Quentin Woods, her director of studies. She had a tutorial with him. Uh, did she go to it? Have you checked? Yes, of course. It was the first thing I thought of. But perhaps he kept her late, talking. Did he often do that? Well, a bit. Talking about her work, you mean? That and other things. What other things? Oh, I don't know. Does it matter? It might. It's no secret. I, I think Quentin fancies Linda, you, you know, in a harmless sort of way. And you didn't mind? No, not really. I mean, he's old enough to be her father. And last night, was there any talking? No. He said she left properly anxious to get home. At least that's what he said. But she never got here. Is sugar, Sergeant? Uh, two, please, Miss Gower. Oh, sweet tooth, I see. Yeah. <laughs> there. Oh, uh, thank you. Hmm. <laughs> it's lovely. It's our geeling. Oh? Oh, I'm sorry we can't be more help, Sergeant, but we really don't pry into other people's business, do we, Betty? Certainly not. I just thought you might have noticed Miss Jackson leaving the house. I was engaged in the back garden all the afternoon. I would have seen nothing. Oh, we're very keen gardeners, you see. You could really imagine you were out in the country. And I yeah, yeah, I I'm sure. Um, how old do you know Miss Jackson and Dr. Avery? Hardly at all. Mm -hmm. They're perfectly satisfactory tenants. That's all we ask. Uh, of course. So you were happy to have them in the house? An old house like this requires a deal of looking after, Sergeant. We have to rent out the flat economic necessity. Oh, and we've been so lucky with our tenants. We had a visiting professor from America, Morton, a charming man. Yes. And now the young doctor and Miss Jackson. She's a lovely girl, you know. Uh, quite striking, I understand. Tall, mm. long auburn hair. Yes. Oh, I do hope she's all right. One does read such dreadful things. Frightful. And I shall need photographs of all three girls. Right, sir. You've arranged to have extra lines opened and manned? Yes, sir, from 6.30. Good. Someone in this area must have seen one of them. The reward might help, sir. The local papers will splash it tonight. A thousand pounds might stir the odd memory. Yes. Cousins must be really fond of Kate Minden to offer that sort of money. And if we find her, we won't be far from the others. I was wrong, Abbott, wasn't I? Badly wrong, complacent. Why, as you said, it looked like coincidence until the third. And Linda Jackson is different. There's no evidence she had any reason to disappear. She had everything going for her. Well, perhaps this television appeal will turn something up. I hope so, Abbott. Three disappearances, three lookalikes. There's a pattern now, you see. That's not good, is it? it suggests planning. Planning? And I'm beginning to see obsession. Someone who's dangerously unbalanced. We need to find these girls quickly. Good evening, sir. See what you started out there? My God, the power of television. Oh, you came across very well, sir. Natural star quality, fluent. Yes, yeah, thank you, Albert. Anything useful turned up? Yeah, a couple. I've got the details here. We've had the usual cranks, of course. Of course. And dozens of reported sightings from the breadth of the land, no doubt. Oh, they mean well. I expect so. Well, there are two so far, you see. Yeah, retired headmistress says she saw Kate waiting at the bus oh, stop. Oh, come on, Abbott, we know that. The two bus drivers... Hang on, sir, there's more. She also saw a car stop and pick Kate up. Did she know? Yeah. That's better. But the driver? Did mm. she see the driver? Oh, yeah, that's the problem. You see, she was waiting on the other side of the road trying to cross. Uh, you remember what the traffic was like that yes. night? Well, she remembers Kate at the stop... Uh, when she saw a picture on the television tonight, it came back to her. And? 
she noticed a car pull up, but then one of those big R ticks stopped in front of her. By the time it moved on, Kate and the car are gone. And she didn't get sight of the driver? No, it was raining. The windows were all misted up. The car, then? She's not very good on cars, I'm afraid. Oh, she must have noticed something, damn it all. She thought it was blue, blue or green. A great help. Well, I'll go and see her, of course, but I don't think she'll do much better. At least we know it was a car. She was picked up. Yeah, true. Then perhaps Doyle wasn't lying when he said I thought I might have heard a car drive off. Perhaps Mary Rush did go off in a car. But Linda, why should she get into a car so close to home? And what happened to her bike? Oh, I don't know if we're much further on, Abbott. Mm. And the second call? Ah, oh, well, he wouldn't give his name, but uh, someone wanted the reward money, the thousand pounds. Well, there's been lots of nutters claiming that. Yeah, of course, but he knows Kate Minden all right. Details he gave me about her and so on. Look. I see. Now, that is interesting. Is he coming in? Oh, no, refused. We, or that is you, have got to go to him. He'll be in, uh, uh, this... Hub. We found it on the map just here. Look, uh, I've got directions. Just you, he said. Take anyone with you and he won't talk. And you have to take the cash with you. Draw it from petty cash to her. I told him it didn't work like that. And what did our mysterious friend say? Take it or leave it. Well, I think I'd better take it, don't you? Oh, come, of course. Keep up. No, 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 no. You stay here. Monitor the calls. If I'm sorry, it could be dangerous. That's all right, Albert. I'm a policeman, remember? I got the distinct impression he didn't like policemen. No, I don't suppose he would. Not if he's who I think he is. Mind if I join you? Detective Superintendent Thorne. You by yourself, like I said. Quite alone. You better be. I don't trust you bastards. Not always seen eye to eye with the law, have you? Mr. Minden. How the hell did you know who I... in your mugshot. Good likeness. Once you sniffed money, I thought you might call. So, where is it? Oh, really, Mr. Minden. Information first. Now, where is your wife, Kate? There. The whore. Look at her. Certainly looks like her. Well, of course it bleeding is. I should know, shouldn't I? Miss High and Mighty, she always was. Now look at her like that. All trussed up like some bloody chicken. <laughs> I didn't know she was into that stuff. Never let on to me, the bitch. How do you know about these pictures of your wife? Oh, I didn't. But why? Look, I've been in prison, haven't I? Cooped up. Not set my eyes on a woman. So you were just browsing, is that it? Snuffling in the porn trough. Look, don't you stop preaching. How do I know these photographs are recent? Well, it's this month's edition. Just out. Look at the date. That doesn't mean the pictures are new, does it? Your wife might have posed for these a long time ago. Oh, no. Not when she was with me, she didn't. Not when she was my wife. I'd have sorted her oh, out. Oh, you're a man of stern morality, Mr. Minden. Grievous bodily harm is one thing, but you... I don't have to listen to this. I want the money. Sit down, Minden. That's better. The reward was for information leading to the whereabouts of your wife. These pictures don't tell us where she is, do they? Well, find out who took them, then you'll know. Possibly, and then, and only then, will we consider the matter of the thousand pounds. You sod. What really matters to you, the money or your missing wife? For all I know, you might have met up with her since coming out. You might... You're mad, you Just leave your address with me, Mr. Minden. I'm sure your parole officer would like it, too. Oh, and, um... I'll give you a receipt for your magazine. I should have known better than to trust a pig. Take my advice, Mr. Minton. Try to keep out of trouble. Bastard. It's in Clapham, south side of the Common, he said. Right, well, we'll be there about 3.30. Fix it for then. Yeah, they don't just publish girly mags. Uh, he was very keen to tell me that, was Mr. Sharp. Probably thought we were the vice squad. <laughs> <laughs> he said the Kate Minden set of pics came in about three weeks ago. Which was when she disappeared. Yeah. But why should she turn to that? I mean, it seems way out of character. I agree. We know she was ambitious for Zelda, but not enough to prostitute herself. Do you think she was forced? Possibly, and that worries me. And what about Minden? I mean, was that just coincidence, him picking up that magazine? Well, I don't think he has the guile for anything too complicated, but I could be wrong. I just don't see what connects these three girls. Apart, that is, from their physical similarities. Two from the city, one out in the sticks, different lifestyles, no point of contact. That we know about. Indeed. Someone knew all three. But who? Doyle? Oh, he's always boasted about his reputation with the ladies. I can't see him mixing in Linda's circle, can you? Don's, doctors, so? Hardly, but we must rule nothing out. 
All we know for certain is that Peter Cousins admits to being with Kate just before she vanished and that Brian Doyle was with Mary Rush and that tutor chap... Quentin Wood. Right, he was the last one to see Linda. That we know about. Unless she did make it home, in which case Paul Avery comes into the frame. Yes. Something struck me about the good doctor. He was evasive over one point. Did you notice? No, afraid not, sir. Just a small thing. When I asked him what their celebration dinner was for, he hesitated before saying it was his birthday. I wonder why. He had a lot in his mind, didn't he? Not thinking straight. Probably. However, I think we have to check them out, all of them. Let's find out where they were, who they were with, when all three girls disappeared. Right, sir. Get back to Sergeant Morrison Cullenbury. Might be quite a bit tougher this time around. He didn't take kindly to Doyle calling him chubby. He <laughs> can interview Doyle. <laughs> you can go back and see Mr. Cousins. Have a word with Avery, too. Oh, what about Quentin Woods? I'll see, uh, Uncle Quentin. Morning in the groves of Academia, but very good for me. <laughs> One hesitates to criticize a fellow academic, I contend that Professor Wellsberg has not only misinterpreted the poem, but misinterpreted his misinterpretation. <laughs> I will thank you, ladies and gentlemen. We shall resume the entertainment in the same place, same time next week. Uh, thank you, Dr. Very impressive, Dr. Woods, if I may say. Stimulating. Oh, thank you. I don't believe I've seen you at one of my lectures before. Are you a mature student, Mr. Sadly Lee? not. Uh, this is a unique occasion. The Norse sagas, is that your field? I'm afraid not. Huh. That's my field. Oh. I see. A somewhat unorthodox approach, if I might say. I didn't want to take up too much of your valuable time. How considerate, but I fear you may be wasting your valuable time. I really can add nothing more. Yes, I've seen your statement. I'm desperately concerned, of course. Of course. He's a most talented student. Attractive, too. Yeah, as you say, uh, attractive, too. However, after Miss Jackson left my I've house... I've not come to ask about Miss Jackson. I beg your pardon? The other two girls, you know about them? Right. Know about the case? Uh, from the papers. Please look at these photographs for me. Look, I don't Please. see why... Well? Have you seen either or both of those girls before? No. Sure? Positive. And now, if you'll excuse me... I'd like you to do one more thing for me, Dr. Woods. Well? I want you to try to remember where you were and who you were with on two specific occasions. Look, this is silly. Perhaps. But... And tricky. So if I just tell you the dates and times now, I'll call back in a day or two to see if you've remembered. I'll come to your house, shall I? Out of office hours. But you surely don't think I had anything to do with Kate's disappearance. All the others. We have to check everything, Mr. Cousins. Well, I dare say, but I was very fond of Kate. I am very fond of Kate. Even though... Yes. Even though. What you told me about her past, that doesn't change anything, Sergeant. Of course. Uh, perhaps if I could just ask you to think back, sir. Where were you at the times I've mentioned? Well, it's very difficult, Sergeant. Can you remember where you were at a particular time a week or so ago? It's my job to remember, sir. Well, I'll try. Tell me again. Saturday 17th, fortnight ago. Let's see now. Saturday the 17th, here we are. I worked in the morning, looked at a couple of properties. Where? Um, both in North Oxford. May I have the addresses? Yes, but I'm sure the owners will recall my visit. I'm sure they will. And in the afternoon? That's easy. I went to the cottage. I go most weekends. Alone? Yes, Sergeant. Alone. This cottage, sir, where is it? Aston St. Mary. You know it? Oh, it's a lovely spot, yeah. It's one of my favourite Cotswold villages. I have a flat in town, but I need to escape from time to time. Tell me, sir, Aston St. Mary, uh, how far would that be from Copley Wood? From Copley Wood? Oh, not far. Three or four miles, perhaps. Oh, really? Close as that. And the evening Linda went missing, he said he was in his flat? Yes, but alone. Stayed in all night. A solitary man, our Mr. Cousins. Not married, no girlfriend. Did he tell you that? No, the girl's in the office. But he likes women, you say? Well, they say. He really does fancy Kate, they reckon. Enough to snatch her away. And Mary, and Linda. He certainly doesn't come across as a weirdo. Neither did Crippin. But he was near Columbury when Mary Rush vanished in Copley Wood. Brian Doyle was nearer, and he can't account for his movements when the two others disappeared. Morris has talked to him? Yes, claims to have been out on the town, drinking. Which town? Oxford. He doesn't deny that. Then he could have been... It's possible. 
What about Dr. Avery? What did he have to say for himself? Junior hospital doctors raced around like scalded cats. He was on duty officially on every occasion, but uh, disappeared for half an hour. No one would have noticed. It's like a madhouse, sir. Eh? Oh, very encouraging. Round here, Robert. Why? Two miles to Tatham. Uh, one thing, though. You were right about his birthday. What? I checked with the hospital administrator. Avery's birthday is in two months' time. Well done. Now, why the, now why the hell should he lie about that? I don't know, sir. Doesn't make much sense, does it? Nothing makes much sense at the moment. But once we find out who took those photographs... All our printing is done here, Superintendent, on these machines. If we could go somewhere quieter, Mr. Sharp. We used to, of course, come into the office. Thank you. I thought you'd like to see the whole setup. Not at the moment. Oh, well, please do sit down. Thank you. On the telephone, I was led to believe... What did you lead Mr. Sharp to believe, Sergeant? Nothing, sir. Just asked about the pornographic pictures. I did explain that particular magazine is a very small part of our business. Not a part I take any pride in, but market forces, you know, there does regrettably seem to be a demand... You publish obscene material, Mr. Sharp. Well, I wouldn't... There are laws which cover that. I haven't broken them, really, I no, haven't. Perhaps not. My colleagues in the vice squad would know. But surely... If you're totally it... honest with me, Mr. Sharp, if I can rely on your full cooperation, there may be no need to involve them. Who sent you the pictures we're interested in? Calls himself Brown. Speak up. Brown. J.P. Brown. Really? How unusual. The, the slides were unsolicited. Most of our material reaches us like that. But you must have an address to pay him. Let me guess. An accommodation address. A box number. I'm afraid so. Uh, a box number in Oxford. Well, if you give it to us, I dare say we'll track it down. And I shall want the original slides. Not that I expect much from them. They'll have been well handled. Yes, I... I put them ready for you. Yes. And, uh... The new ones. New ones? What new ones? This morning's post, just after I'd spoken to the sergeant. From the same source, J.P. Brown? Yes. Here we are. Uh, same girl, but with another girl. Uh, you'll see, I'll put the slide in the light box for you. There. A tableau. That's what we call it when Is there's more than... what you call it? Yes. That's Mary Rush, sir, isn't it? With Kate... I shall need to take these slides. Of course. I confess I would have used them. You see, Mr. Brown's work is of a high technical quality, although it does uh, lack animation. Good God, man, of course it lacks animation. Look at the expressions in their eyes. Those wretched girls are out of their minds. I'm sorry? Drugged, Mr. Sharp. Heavily sedated in some way. Oh, dear, I didn't realise. Believe me, I would never tarnish our reputation. If you wish to preserve one shred of your tattered reputation, Mr. Sharp, you will do two things for me instantly. Of course, anything. Send payment for these new slides in the usual way to this accommodation address. Yes, yes, I will. And if you receive any more material from J.P. Brown, you will contact me on this number. I understand. But do you think there will be more? Oh, I think there might. Another girl. I see. Am I to be told what this is all about? No. I wouldn't want you to compromise your integrity. You despise me, Superintendent, don't you? You can redeem yourself, Mr. Sharp. Send that money to J.P. Brown and you will help us apprehend a degenerate and dangerous man. You might even be saving someone's life. Well, just in time, gents. Closing up soon. Mr. Hunter. That's me. I suggest you close up now. We'll wait. Hey, what? Oh, I see. Chief Superintendent Thorne and this is Detective Sergeant Abbott. So, what can I do for you, gents? We'd like a description of one of your customers. Get dozens in here for fags, A newspapers. special customer, one that uses this accommodation address. Well, I do that for quite a few people, too. We're only interested in one, Mr. J.P. Brown. So? You do have a customer of that name? Yes, I think so. Only think? A lot of people pick up mail here. But you keep records? Not really. Accounts, of course, all strictly kosher. But we know J.P. Brown used your services recently. Didn't he, Mr. Hunter? Could be. So what yes. does he look like, this Mr. Brown? Hard to say. Nothing special. Come on, you can do better than that. Height. Tall or short? Medium, I'd say. Medium height. Not fat, not thin. What about accent? Any accent? Never spoke much. Just handed over the package. Well, not much to talk about, is there? You're telling us nothing, Hunter. Sorry. I'd like to help. If I could. Well, you can. And you will. 
Huh? From tomorrow, there will be several plainclothes officers here out in the back. When Brown shows up, as he will sooner or later, you will identify him to the officers. Is that clear? Can you do that? I mean, can you make me? Would you rather I call in the VAT inspectors and the forward squad to examine your accounts, Mr. Hunter? Would you like that? Oh, you're not going to eat that sausage, sir? Mm. No, take it. Oh, sorry. I lost my appetite. Oh. oh, something in the paper, is it? United lost again. Never bothered an evening one. How could he be so bloody stupid? Who? Oh. Look. Where? That headline, Missing Girls, New Lead. He assured me he'd say nothing. And Chief Constable Merivale promised that an arrest was imminent in the case of the three missing local girls. He revealed that officers had uncovered a link between the girls and a pornography racket. He paid what has they all got for a brain, mushy peas? If Brown reads this, he won't go anywhere near Hunter, will he? Not if he's got any sense, he won't. Coming! On time! You're a punctual man, Mr. Brown. <laughs> I hope you don't mind me phoning, but, well, I thought we ought to have a little chat, eh? Come through to the back. It's nice and private there. I got a nice drop of scotch. <laughs> One blow, but several. Mm -hmm. Cover the spill of the fact. Oh, yes. Ah, we have the cavalry, too late as always. <laughs> Lesion right here. Yeah. Compound fracture. Yes. They're in here, sir. Good morning, Thorne. You knew the deceased, they told me. Not a good friend, though. He could have been a useful one. What have you got so far? Uh, almost everything. I can tell you how, when, and where, but not, I fear, who. So? Time of death between 10 p.m. and midnight, stopped from behind with a blunt object. You still call them blunt objects, do you? Several blows. He was only a small man. It didn't require great strength. And he was put off guard, I should say. The drink, glasses on the table. <sighs> He's pitching a cosy chat, poor sod. I don't think the autopsy will tell me much more. We'll take him away when you're finished. Right. I bet I'll carry on here. You get the house to house going. Yes. Someone in the street might have noticed something last night. Not a good word to say for him. No one in the street. I reckon he was up to all sorts of shady fiddles. My guess is that Hunter was going in for a spot of extortion. He saw the newspaper article and put two and two together. Yeah, being character from what the neighbours told me. But they saw nothing. Nothing of Brown. They were all inside watching the box, weren't they? But this lady opposite? No, uh, Mrs Fleming. She was sure about a car? Oh, yes. She went to bed about 11. As she was drawing the curtain, she saw this car pulling away. Could have been anyone in the street. Well, she said it was a car she didn't recognise. She knows most of them. An observant lady. Bit of a nosy park, I'm all right. Oh, I think the law of the curtain twitches. And she is certain that it was a Ford Escort. Yeah, convinced. The son-in-law has one. So, what do we have? A green or blue Ford Escort. It's hard to tell the difference in the dark. But that was what the retired headmistress thought as well. The car that picked Kate Minden up at the bus stop, that was blue or green. It does sound as if it might be the same car. Perhaps Doyle was right. It could have been the same car that took Mary Rush away. And this time we do have a bit more, the number. No, not much of it. She's pretty sure it was an F, Reg, and the first number was a four, but that's all. That could be enough. How many blue or green escorts with those characteristics are registered in Oxfordshire, Abbott? God knows. We'll give you a list. You shall, we'll give you a list. You shall, we'll give you a list. You shall, we'll give you a list. Yeah, but... Uh, I mean, it would take forever to check them all out, huh? and the car might have been registered of anyway. Of course, but have you got a better idea? No. No, I suppose not. In the meantime, we shall need to check again on the whereabouts of Mrs. Cousins, Doyle, Avery and Woods. They shouldn't have any problems remembering where they were last night, should they? Sir, aren't we forgetting Steve Minden? He's got four, he's out there somewhere. Oh, no, I've not him? forgotten. I saw him as the most likely contender. I put out an APB on him. That's why I know he didn't kill Hunter. How can you be sure? He spent last night in the cells at Banbury Police Station, arrested after a pub brawl. Ah. Wonderful, isn't it? He was the one I suspected most. So... Until we have anything further to go on, we'd better eliminate the others. Sure you don't want a cup? No, thank you, Dr. Avery. You don't mind if I do, I... 
shan't stay awake without the cabin. Please. I haven't slept much the last week. No, they work you too hard. And the worry. If I close my eyes, I keep... Think... We're doing all we can, Dr. Avery. Yeah. In the paper, it said you were going to make an arrest. I would have thought by uh, now... There have been a done. few setbacks. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to have to ask you more questions, but it is necessary. If it will help, Linda. I hope it will. So, if you would just tell me where you were last night, between nine and midnight. Me? Why should that have Please. Any... At the hospital. I, I was on duty until this morning. You were there all night? You never left? Correct. Oh, well, well no, that's not strictly true. Please be strictly true, Dr. Avery. Well, we take breaks. We have to. I, I just took a stroll to get a breath of fresh air. We have... Breath. And where did you stroll? Uh, just in the grounds. Uh, it, it was a warm night, and I kept thinking of Linda. How long were you away? About half an hour, I suppose. What time was this? Uh, well, I'm not sure. Uh, must have been about 11. Casualty was quiet when I got back, so the pubs couldn't have shut. Do you have a car, Dr. Avery? Mm hmm Where do you keep it? Well, at the hospital. Parking's hopeless here. The landlady has the use of the garage. What make? Well, nothing very grand. Not at my salary. A Ford. An Escort? <laughs> no, a Fiesta. A clapped-out Fiesta. I've checked, sir, and Doyle definitely doesn't have a car, just his motorbike. But... But what? His dad has a blue escort. F. Rich? No, much older, eh? I suppose our curtain twitcher could have been mistaken. She only got a glimpse. Oh, she seems so certain. I reckon, too, she can tell a fiesta from an escort. I'll check with her again, but she didn't have any doubts. Left here, under the bridge. And Doyle was out in the piss again. Well, he never seems to do anything else. He had a terrible hangover. Couldn't remember much about last night. He'll remember if I get hold of him. Not that I really see him behind this. It's all too clever, the photographs, accommodation address, that's all beyond Doyle. What about Quentin Woods? Conference in London, three days devoted to Anglo-Saxon heroic verse. Really? Oh, they're in with me. He went last night about eight o'clock. Not in a blue escort, by any chance? By train, or so his housekeeper said. Which leaves just cousins. Yeah. I don't see him in this. Why put up a thousand pounds of his own money? Would you do that if he was guilty? I would. That's just what I would have done, Abbott. Oh, I don't know. He doesn't come across like that. You'll see. Mm, perhaps. If his office is right, he ought to be at a site meeting about now. Foot down, Abbott. Yeah, I'll do better than that, sir. I'm sorry, Sergeant, but a lot of money is involved here. This had better be important. Yes, sir, I assure you. Yes, well. This is Mr. Carson, Superintendent. This is really very embarrassing, Superintendent, being hauled out in the middle of a psych meeting. I dare say, Mr. Cousins, that this is now a murder inquiry. We won't keep you long. Yes, of course, I'm sorry. You're sure this man, Hunter, was connected with Kate and the other girls in some way? Yes. But how can I help? Simply by telling us where you were late last night, sir. Oh, not that again. I'm not stupid, and I know you have to suspect everyone... But don't you understand what I feel about Kate? I suppose I'm half in love with her. Not that I said anything, but I will, when you find her. If you would just tell us, sir, last night... I stayed in the flat, and before you ask, I was alone. And you were in all evening? Yes, nursing a cold. Really? Seems to have cleared up? Yes, it does. You must let me know what pills you take. Look, is there anything else? They're waiting for me. There is a recession. Do you have a car with you, Mr. Cousins? Yes. The red one over there. Why? Nothing. Well, we mustn't detain you. Nice flats they're building here. Expensive. We're handling the sales. Is that why you have a camera with you? Glossy pictures for the brochure? Yes, something like that. I use it all the time. Keen on photography, then, are you, Mr. Cousins? I know a bit about it. Helps in this job. Yes, I expect it does. Never know what might turn up worth photographing. There you are. Come away from there. What are you doing? Playing? Now, what you got there? Leave it. Oh, get out of that water, you stupid animal. Come on. Oh. oh, no. Oh, my God. Bit more complicated, this one, Thorne. More of a professional challenge. Another friend of yours? No. There's no doubt it is Kate Minden, sir. No, I'm afraid not. 
We'll bring her mother in, do a formal identification. We'll try and tidy her up a bit, but she'll still look a mess, I'm afraid. Bad facial scarring. What caused it? Do you know yet? Some sort of acid, probably fuming nitric. Or hydrochloric. Possibly, I suppose. What makes you think of that? It's used regularly in photographic processing. She's been scalped. She's been scalped. Oh, why should anyone do that? You're sure she was dead before she was put in the river? Absolutely. No water in the lungs, you see. And apart from the acid burns, no marks of violence, no sexual abuse. So what killed her? My surmise at this stage is heart failure. Heart failure? Probably induced by the acid attack. You see, she suffered from a heart abnormality. The sort of thing you find after a childhood attack of rheumatic fever. Perhaps that explains her passion for success, her thriftiness. She wanted to ensure her child was provided for. Poor little Zelda. I mean, she was vulnerable, certainly. And a massive shock to the That's system. A struggle. She, she tried to get away or something. Um, when she died, whoever was keeping her panicked and dumped the body in the river. But why go to the bottom of shearing off the hair? Ah, whoever did this must be mad. Crazy. They don't always have reasons, do they? Oh, but they do, according to their own deranged logic. The hair is significant in some way, I'm sure of that. I'll confirm all this for you in my report. Oh, there's one more thing you should know. She had been massively sedated. I expected that. Any idea what with? Well, one of the major tranquilizers. Hmm. Cover her up, Sergeant. You know, I'll never get used to this. Never. Uh. Poor kid. I'm sorry to disturb you, but I knew you were in. Good morning, ladies. Uh, will you come in? Uh, uh, no. We were just going out shopping when we heard the news on the radio. What news? Well, they found the body of one of those poor girls. What? In the river. Yes. Oh, no. Who? Did, uh, did they say? Did they, they say who it was? No, but we thought you should know. I, I mean, I'm sure it wasn't your... your Miss Jackson, but... Yes, but it could be, couldn't it? Let's not pretend. Now, the police. Well, they would know, you see. Well, they came here, didn't they? They were the ones in charge. Of course, I, I was going to... But we have the car out. We can drive you there. Yes. It won't take a moment. It would put your mind at rest, wouldn't it? For God's sake, what's happened? I was going to contact you, Dr. Avery. It isn't Linda. Thank God for that. I know, of course, that it's still... Terrible. But I'm afraid it means she's in great danger. We have to find her and Mary Rush. I can't have anything less than your full cooperation, so stop... Lying to me, Dr. Avery. What do you mean, lying? It wasn't your birthday, was it, the day Linda vanished? Oh, that. No, I, I'm sorry, but there was a reason. Tell me. Well, Linda and I, you see, we're, we're married. We have been for a year, and it was our anniversary. Why the secret? Money. Linda's grants and bursaries would have been affected by a change in her status. I suppose it must seem a bit of a cheat, but... Well, we Quite afford... a practice deception. Is there anything else you've been deceiving me about? No. Did you take photographs of your wife, Dr. Avery, of an intimate kind? No, of course I did. Why, of course? Is that so shocking to you? Uh, Linda hated having a photograph taken. Well, you know, so, some people are like You that. mean you tried it and she wouldn't cooperate? No. But, but, but I knew she had a thing about it, she told me. I, I mean, she once had a minor row with her tutor over it. With Quentin Woods? Yes. He's a camera freak and he wanted her to pose for him. Now, I mean, nothing sinister, just a skewed old portrait, but she wouldn't. I see. Sir, I've got something. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't... Oh, that's all right, Sergeant. Dr. Avery is just going. Oh, yes. The ladies will be waiting for you. We know where to find you if we need you. Look, you still can't think that Goodbye, I... Doctor. Oh, you look a bit green about the girls. I must see Woods as soon as he's back from London. Really? So, what have you got for me, Albert? The list from Swansea. Well? I got a team checking out the details. I thought it would take forever, but no, as soon as we got to the seas... As in sea for cousins? Yeah. But he's got a golf. He also has a sister, and she lives with Mum and Dad in Wanted. And? She owns a blue escort. F registered, 468 and so on. But if it's her car... Wait, I've got a PC to call at the house, crime prevention stuff. The girl's away at college. She leaves the car at home in term time. So, cousins could have had access to a blue escort... But why should he bother? He's got a perfectly good car of his own. But it's a connection, isn't it? I know it could be a coincidence, but what else have we got? Nothing much. And he admits he was besotted with Kate, and he takes photographs. And he's a loner. He doesn't seem to have girlfriends. Perhaps he, he can't form relationships. The other girls, well, they're lookalikes, aren't they? Kate rebuffed him, so he finds substitutes. Well, it makes some kind of sense. We can also establish a link with Columbry. 
He could have spotted Mary Rush there, followed her. But, Linda, we can't tie him in with Linda Jackson. I think I can. I've been back to check. Check what? The house opposite is for sale. I noticed when I was interviewing the two old ladies upstairs, I saw the sign out of their window. One of Cousin's properties, right? Right. So he must have been there. And that's when he could have noticed Linda, the long auburn hair. Another one for his collection. You see, sir? Circumstantial, but it does fit. Kate's dead. Murdered by some pervert. It's about bloody time you found him. Believe me, Mr. Cousins, I understand your distress. Do you? You have a funny way of showing it with your constant snide insinuations. Well, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but I never drive my sister's car. I am not holding two girls captive in either my flat or my cottage. And if you don't believe me, go and search. I never said I didn't believe you. And another thing. I did not visit that house we're selling. I don't deal with that part of the city. May I ask who did? I can check the file. Could it have been Kate Minden? Just a minute. Yes, it was. Kate did all the work over there. Could that be important? It might be. Thank you for your help, Mr. Cousins. Is that all, then? For the moment. You find him, Inspector. Because if I find him, I'll kill him with my bare hands. And you needn't come and call on me, then, because I'll come down to your office and I'll boast about it. Sherry, Superintendent? No, thank you, sir. And you, Sergeant? Uh, no, not for me, thank you. Then I shall drink alone. I need it. These conferences can be extremely tiresome. And you've only just come back, sir? About 20 minutes ago. The train was late, of course. Did you stay in London overnight? Mm, in my club. It's very peaceful there. People would remember you, I dare say. <laughs> well, you'll have to ask them, won't you? You must play these silly games. The other dates I left with you. Have you been able to... I've taken advice, Thorne, for personal reasons and to avoid embarrassment to, uh, shall we say, a lady friend. I don't care to discuss my movements with you. I'm under no obligation to do so. This is a murder inquiry, Dr. Woods. Two deaths. I would have thought that outweighed any worries about your sordid little peccadilloes. How dare you talk Your reputation as a womanizer is hardly a state secret. I think you better Did you me. exercise your charm on Linda Jackson? Did she rebuff you, is that it? I'm going to call my solicitor. You may well need him. I understand you had an argument with Linda because she refused to let you take her photograph. No. No, 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 it wasn't like that. You, you, you can't believe that. Please. Tell us how it was, then, sir. I'm a keen photographer. I specialise in portraiture. Linda has a wonderful bone structure, so I simply asked her to sit for me. But she refused? Yes, but, I mean, there was no argument. I, I, I made a little joke of it. Did you? It was a genuine interest. I take photography seriously. I mean, look around you. This is all my work. Yes. Very impressive. This picture of the baby... Yes, my granddaughter. Do you like it? It's most unusual. Abbott. Does this remind you of anything? No, I don't think so. Hang on, that bow. The satin bow. Very distinctive knot, isn't it? Remember the first pictures? The ones of Kate alone? She was trussed up in a satin cord, wasn't she? Of course, and the knot. I'm sure it was the same. Do you ever send any of your photographs away to specialist magazines, sir? Pornographic magazines? That's an appalling question, Superintendent. But I had to ask it, sir. How did you get the idea to present the baby like this, tied in a bow like a chocolate box? Please, sir, it's very important. Well, I, I can't pretend it was an original idea. Several years ago, I saw a similar picture in a photographer's window in Reading. I bought the print. Do you still have it? Somewhere. I, I could try and find it for you. you know, if it's urgent. It could be. Yes. Well, it might take several hours. I'll leave you my number. Please let me know as soon as you find it. I'm trying to do these checks on the tranquilizer prescriptions, but you know our doctors hand them out like sweeties. It could take forever. We don't have forever. We have to find those girls quickly. What about the car numbers? Uh, I'll pull them off that once we've found Cousin's sister. And get them on it. I don't think Cousin's fits. Who do you think does fit? Sir? I'm not sure if we're looking for one man, Eden. To abduct and hold three girls. That needs more than one person, Abbott. I suppose one could be a woman. But this J.P. Brown character could have a wife, a girlfriend, you know, someone besotted by him. Thorn here. Yes, put him through. It's Quentin Woods. Morning, sir. You do? Excellent. Yes. Yes, I've got that. And just the name Vic... Thank you. I'm very grateful to you, sir. 
That's the address of the photographic studio, is it? Yes. The original was the work of a photographer who simply signed himself Vic, so Wood says. We'll need a car, Abbott. Right, sir. Oh, what about Uncle Quentin? Are we forgetting about him? I think so, for the moment, anyway. He did lecture after women. He was the last one to see Linda, and he wouldn't say where he was. Oh, yes, a car for Superintendent Thorne immediately, please. But as far as we know, he doesn't own a Ford Escort. He didn't know Mary Rush or Kate Minden. He was hardly likely to be concealing two women in a house we visited. And he's a distinguished professional man. Yes, I was quitting, sir. Touché. But if you're talking of doctors, your theorising must have brought you round to Dr Avery. Well, I admit it, I've crossed my mind. He could get hold of the drugs. He could have seen Kate at the house opposite, or she might have visited the hospital. Because of her heart condition? Yeah. Uh, it struck me too. But where could Avery detain three women? And where's the connection with Mary Rush? No. I think we're better employed tracking Vic in Reading. It's our one lucky break in this investigation, those photographs of Kate and of the baby. I'm nearly convinced they're taken by the same person. Uh, excuse me, I'm sorry to disturb what? you. Oh, uh, do forgive me. It's always so quiet in the afternoon. Did you just want to browse, or were you looking for a particular title? Uh, neither, I'm afraid. We're police officers. I see. Superintendent. How can I help you? I'm Sylvia Turk, by the way. Turk Books, that's me. How long have you had this bookshop, Mrs. Turk? Oh, forever. Well, nearly ten years. Others come and go in this street. I just carry on. The photographic shop next door, how long has that been for sale? Over a year. But can you wonder in the present economic climate... To think we were once a nation of shopkeepers, Superintendent. It looks in a pretty poor state. What happened to it? Surely you remember. It was a terrible tragedy. The police were all over the place. Um, once the fire brigade had finished. A fire? An accident? Oh, no one seemed to be sure. In the end, the coroner plumped for accidental death. Who died in the fire, Mrs. Turk? Mr. Stein, the owner. Such a nice old man. He often used to pop in for a chat. He lived over the studio. Was Mr. Stein's first name Victor? Oh, no. Richard. Richard David Stein. You must be thinking of his assistant. That was Vic. Brilliant photographer, Vic. Everybody said so. That's why the business flourished. It was such a pity they quarrelled, and over such a silly thing. Who quarrelled? Vic and Mr. Stein, of course. So where's Vic gone now? I don't know. I've never seen her again. Her? Vic was a woman? Oh, sorry. Didn't you know that? Yes. Middle-aged lady. Not much to look at. Not interested in men, I imagine, but wonderful with a camera. This quarrel, what was it about? <laughs> Such a stupid thing. I suppose one shouldn't laugh, but you have to see the funny side of it. Of what, Mrs. Turk? Well, Mr. Stein told me the story in confidence, of course. It seems that one day they were working in the studio and he tripped over something. He clutched at Vic to steady himself, as one does... And to his great embarrassment, he pulled her wig off. So striking it was, too lovely reddish colour. Well, more auburn, I should say. I'd never guessed, though I suppose it was a bit at odds with the rest of her appearance. How did Vic react? Furious. But, you see, poor Mr. Stein was so overcome, he burst into laughter. Well, he couldn't help himself. You know, nervous laughter. Vic stormed out. She never worked for him again. How long after that did the fire take place? Oh, quite soon. A few weeks, at the very most. If Vic was a woman, that would explain why the girls were off guard. Why they might have got into a car with a stranger. And it took no great strength to kill Hunter. Or perhaps as a male accomplice. You said two people. Yes. But a man? No, 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 I don't think so. Yeah, the photography. But there has to be a connection. I'm sure of it, but proof. To find evidence, that could take months. We don't have that time. You saw what happened to Kate. How long before another body turns up? Vic. Well, she could be anywhere. It's been over a year. The car numbers. Perhaps you'll find something there. Oh, that's this evening written off. Hmm. I won't go down well at home, either. I said we go out for a drive. Really? Yeah, I often do on a summer evening, you know. Broadway, Old Copley Woods, Burford. Yeah, I promise What did you say, Abbott? I was just thinking, well, we might Copley go... Copley Woods? You said you'd drive out to Copley Woods? Yeah, people do. It's lovely out brilliant, there. Brilliant, Abbott. Do you know what you are? You're quite brilliant. 
You do understand, Mr. Cousins, that if need be, I shall deny this meeting ever took place. Deny ever being in this pub. Yes, you've made it very clear. You see, I remember what you said. What you'd do if you ever found Kate's killer. Well, I believe I have. What? But I can't prove it. But surely... My superior is a cautious man. He wants more evidence before I can ask for search warrants. But by then, it, well, it might be too late. Well, you're not asking me to strangle anyone with my bare hands. Did I really say that? You did, in a heat of the moment, I expect. I wouldn't, of course. I couldn't. No, I don't believe you would, Mr. Cousins. But you think you can do this? If it goes wrong... If it goes wrong, or if you're wrong, then I will, of course, great distress to an innocent person. Yes, I realize that. And I can't help you. You'll be on your own. I don't think you had any choice, sir. It's not too late, Herbert. This is against all regulations, so you can get out of the car and walk uh, away. I gave up over promotion a long time ago, If sir. this goes wrong, you could be joining the three million unemployed. I saw Kate Minden on that slab, sir. It's worth the risk. How did you persuade Cousins? I didn't have to. I think he really perhaps did love Kate. What time was he going to be there? Ten. He'll be in the car park and see us arrive. Then it's up to him. I hope your information is reliable, Abbott. It's nearly ten now. I think so. With a neighbour like that, you don't need community policing. I'm glad she doesn't live next to me. He looks up. Look, garage doors. Good. Yes, we're in business. A green escort. Got it. It was on the list, of course, just as you said. And only the driver. That's very good. Right, Albert. Now. Not too close. Keep well back. Mr. Kingdon's customer service. Mr. Kingdon's customer service. I can just see them, sir. Two bays away. He's close now. Uh, good morning. I understand you wanted to see me. I'm the manager. Good morning, sir. Please. Oh, dear. What's the problem? No problem. Just routine. We're doing a general security review. Supermarket break-ins are on the increase uh, locally. And... Really? We've had no trouble. I assure you we run... <laughs> Sounds as if you've got some now. Come on, Abbott. How dare you? You did that deliberately. You've you got in my bloody way. You silly cow. That's enough of that. I'm a police officer. Uh, just move along, ladies and gentlemen. Please stand back. If you're a policeman, then arrest this lout. He deliberately attacked me. Oh, bag was in my way. That's no excuse for violence. Violence? I tripped over a stupid trolley. I just grabbed that up. That's not true. It's Miss Foyle, isn't it? Yes. But how did you know? Don't you remember I came to see you a week or so ago about Linda Jackson? Oh, yes. Lucky for you we were here, Miss Foyle. If you'd like to take Miss Foyle to the manager's office, Abbott. Sir, what for? Just so we can take a statement. There could be a case for prosecution here, common assault. Assault? What are you talking about? Then you, young man, will come with me, quietly. I'm not sure if I want to be bothered with this. I need to get back. I'm afraid I must insist, Miss Foyle. Violence cannot be tolerated. Violence? It was an accident, wasn't it? How the hell was I supposed to know she was wearing a bloody wig? Abbott, will you tell the manager not to let anyone in here? Right, sir. You were very convincing. Quite the larger lot, Mr. Cousins. When I grabbed her hair and it came off, I nearly carried on. Put my hands round her throat. But it still doesn't take us all the way. I'm sure she's big. I know she has a car that matches the description, and she has an accomplice, Miss Gower. And you can tie her in with two other girls. Linda lived in the same house, and Kate came to the house opposite. They would have seen her then. And Mary Rush. I can explain that as well, thanks to Sergeant Abbott. Huh? Well, you see, if Abbott goes for evening drives to Copley Woods, then why not Miss Foyle and Miss Gower? They're country types, fresh air and gardening. I'm sure that's where they saw Mary, running in distress away from her boyfriend. <sighs> She'd be grateful for a lift in that state, wouldn't she? Yes, from two kind, middle-aged ladies... They might even have been watching her for days. And she fitted their requirements with her long auburn hair. Well, you'll find Mary now, won't you? Her and Linda. Poor Kate. I'm sorry, Mr. Cousins. Very sorry. But I could still have got it all horribly wrong, even now. Well, we'll soon know. What do I do when we get there? Stay in the car. I've bent enough rules for one day. Yes? 
Miss Gow? Yes. Police. May I come in a moment? Uh, well, it's not really very convenient. Just for a moment? Thank you. Um... I expect you know I'm heading the investigation into the death of Kate Minden, as well as the two missing girls. My sergeant called on you, I believe, Sergeant Abbott. Uh, yes, about poor Miss Jackson. Oh, I'm afraid there was very little we could tell him. Indeed. We're still a long way from finding them, I have to say. Oh, dear. So we have to double-check everything. Look everywhere, that is, in any way connected with the case. You understand that, I'm oh, sure. Well, yes, but... Uh, this I... house is connected with the case. Linda Jackson lived here. Oh, yes, in, in the downstairs flat. I know. Illogical, really, but my superiors do insist. It won't take me more than a few moments. Purely routine. Uh, Shall we start down here? Oh, no. Uh, no, it, it, it's not convenient now, and it's pointless anyway. I agree, but that's the way the system works, I'm afraid. We just have to plod on. Now, shall we start in the kitchen? Uh, I warrant... A search warrant, you must get one. Oh, I hardly think we need be as formal as that, Miss Gower. Do we? <sighs> I was so sure. So sure. Nothing. You looked everywhere, sir. Everywhere. Every room, every cupboard. She seemed so nervous. Particularly when I asked to see the attic room. But nothing. Nothing there. You said room. Attic. Room. Yes. There are two parallel. We sell a lot of these houses. You're sure? Yes. There'd be a connecting door. There was a screen against the wall. The door will be behind it. This time you're coming too, to help with regulations. Please. I had no idea. Really. It's locked. The key, Miss Gower. Now. Oh, God, I didn't know. Please. Stand by. Mr. Cousins? The light. Where's the light? Oh, it's here. Oh, God. Miss Jackson? Mary? I didn't want to. She made me. She did. Nothing. I'll tell you nothing. You're not obliged to. Did Sergeant Abbott tell you that, Miss Foyle? I did, sir. Your friend, Miss Gower, has been most cooperative. Told us everything. You forced her, she said. Bullied her. I can believe that. You can believe what you like. An accident, she says. Kate tried to escape. A struggle. Was it like that? Never mind. Linda and Mary will be able to tell us in due course. Once they've recovered from what you did to them, drugged, bound, degraded, what have they ever done to you, Miss Boyle? Tell me that. Help me to understand. You? What could you know? How they flaunted their beauty, abused it. How did they abuse it, Miss Foyle? To amuse men. Men like you. Because that's all you see. It's all you want, isn't it? The rest of us are filth. Lower than the animals. Girls like that. Don't expect me to cry for them. Because now they know what it's like to be ugly. To be used. No, Miss Foyle, I don't understand. But, fortunately, I don't need to. I can leave that to others. It's nice out here. You've got to admit it. One of your better ideas. Oh, I needed the fresh air after that venom, that hatred. It must have been about here they picked up Mary Rush. Yes, poor kid. They'll be all right. Oh, in time. Physically, anyway, the bruises will heal, the hair will grow. But mentally, who knows what scars will be left on the mind. Uh, Miss Gower's statement gives us all the details, anyway. She was very much the submissive partner, did what she was told. She admits driving the car to Hunter's shop, but she just waited outside, and she insists Kate's death was heart failure. Do you believe her? Uh, I might if it wasn't for the acid, the sculpt hair. That was Miss Foyle. Or Vic, as she used to be. 
that one could be capable of anything. There's such hatred there. More than I've seen for a long time. But it's calculating and controlled. Not insane, then? Oh, I don't know. Such a fine line. She's got a coldly rational side to her. Look at the way they brazenly drove Avery to see me the morning that Kate was found in the river. Yes, why did they do that? Oh, so he would confirm for them that it was Kate's body. Oh, I see. You're oh, very calculating. That sounds sane enough to me. They hated Kate's beauty and destroyed it, driven by an obsession. Pornography is the key. I don't understand that part of it. It degraded the beauty she both envied and hated. And if you think about it, it gave her power over men. I've no doubt we shall have a belly full of psychiatrist reports before we finish, but my guess is the incident with Stein, the wig, and the setting fire to his shop tipped her over the edge, ignited the paranoia. So she is mad, then? Well, beyond reason, anyway. We'd better get back. It's getting cold. And the chief constable will be wanting our report. Ah. Oh, um... What are you going to tell him, sir? About cousins? That business in the supermarket? I shall gloss over it, Abbott. Not confuse him with details. After all, he's got something to tell the press. Take their mind off the art thefts. Will we get away with it, sir? <laughs> Why not, Abbott? We got a result, didn't we? We got a result. John Castle played Thorne. Andrew Branch, Abbott. Jonathan Taffler, Peter Cousins. Michael Cochran, Dr. Avery. And Benjamin Whitrow, Quentin Woods. In Double Negative by John Penn. Brian Doyle was Matthew Morgan. Kate Minden, Jane Whittenshaw. Steve Minden, David Holt. Mrs. Richards and Mrs. Turk, Kate Binchy. Hurst, Philip Anthony. Mary Rush, Teresa Gallagher, Linda Jackson, Sandra James Young, Miss Foyle, Diana Payan, Miss Gower, Jill Graham, The Pathologist and Mr. Sharp, John Baddeley. The play was dramatised by Melville Jones from John Penn's novel Outrageous Exposure. The director was Martin Jenkins. <laughs>